All right, welcome to the Sauce Cast. This is where money and relationships meet. Home, we got an audio problem. We good? I, got I hear you. Now. All right, we're back. We, this we're is, in. <laughs> we are in. You've been having nothing but technical difficulties. I know. I, it follows me. All right, so we'll, let's take it from the top. Welcome to the Sauce Cast, episode forty-one. This is where money and relationships meet, and I couldn't ask for a better panelist. I think uh, so too. This is. I, I agree. So I, I I don't. Like, we've had hot chicks on. We've had celebrities. I've been. I think I've been more excited for this particular show because mm-hmm. I think it's going to be very substantive. Yes. Okay. I think okay. we're going to really get into some stuff. It's going to, you know, we're on Valuetainment, the number one channel in the world for entrepreneurs. Value, tainment. Sometimes it's a little more value driven. Sometimes they're more tainment driven, you know. <laughs> PBD, he's more value. I'm more tainment. But we got George Gammon in the house. We got yes. Rolo Tomasi in the house. So we're going to be extracting value from these legends in finance and intersexual dynamics. dynamics. Boom, all day today. So stay tuned, stay locked in here on the Saucecast on Value Tame. So huge dose of value coming your way. We also got the lovely Kelly that's going to be helping us out here. She just came back from the NFT conference in New York. Oh man, Respect. I got questions for you. I got oh, questions yeah? for you. We got we uh, oh after the show. All right. So <laughs> if you're not familiar with the Saucecast, my name is Adam Sosnick. I'm here to help men improve financially, improve their sexual market value, and just so you can win in life. So I brought some full on winners. To teach you what you need to know, young men and men out there who are looking to improve their lives. So um, what, one of the things I always say here is, you know what? We want to get you paid. We want to get you laid. And we want to let you do it your way. So also, you know, we're up 90% men out there. <laughs> That's a pretty good motto. Thank you. George Gamm. <laughs> so with that being said, we're all familiar with Rolo. So author of The Rational Mail, uh, five books, I five believe. Five books now. Best-selling um, author and, well, certainly dating anyways still, I think. Best hair in the game. Best hair in the game. The yes. connector of all connectors. And I'm grateful that he connected us with Mr. George Gammon, mm-hmm. entrepreneur, investor. I've been wanting to yes. make this happen for a long time, by Yes. The way. Well, I appreciate you guys yeah. inviting me. And uh, red pill financial expert is that is that a uh, can i I go with that yeah maybe red pill economics red pill economics and 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 probably the uh, let's give a shout out to why you guys are even in town right now you're putting on an event called the rebel capitalist here in miami tell us about that bro well it's miami uh it's at the well i won't say the name of the venue because you got to buy a ticket then you get the name so uh but it's i'm super excited we got uh, a bunch of incredible speakers we've got robert kiyosaki is going to be there doug casey uh, Dr. Chris Martinson, Jeff Snyder, who's an expert on the dollar global monetary system. Mm-hmm. We've got Joseph Wang, who used to work at the Federal Reserve, and uh, Kenny McElroy. Jason Hartman. Jason Hartman, uh, Lynette Zhang, Mark Moss, just an incredible lineup, and uh, I couldn't be more excited. How many attendees are you expecting? Probably about 400. Wow, this is a legit thing. Mm-hmm. And this is what? What year is this that you're doing this? This is just... Uh, Pretty much our second year. It's our third event. Okay. We so the we started about a year ago. Awesome. And are you going to be speaking? You're attending. You're no, signing I'm autographs. Doing wor- what I'm are you doing? doing? A workshop. I'm Got doing it. a workshop on Saturday. Uh, okay. Five to seven. So. That's, awesome. Uh, uh, well, it sounds exciting, and you know, good things are happening in Miami. So, uh, welcome. Yeah, back it's to a Miami. great it's yes. a great place to be for people who are uh, truly trying to understand how economics works, mm-hmm. how sound money works i mean you could say it's all about crypto but i think it's more about understanding the principles of austrian economics mm-hmm. and sound money love that so you know i was thinking i don't we're, i mean I'll, I'll let our production team come up with the title of this episode based on what we talk about today but a lot of it is going to be basically relationships and dating in the middle of a potential recession sure. so that's kind yeah. of where i want to start this thing off and um you we kind of brief info in uh informed our audience who you are but let me tee Mm -hmm. up this question for you george because i actually just saw you on kiyosaki you know patrick bet david has been talking about a potential recession jerome powell who just testified in front of congress so i want to pick your brain and then obviously we're going to roll this up to rollo and do what he do because he's an expert in intersexual dynamics but let's start off the topic like this so jerome powell chairman of the fed we all know him yeah uh i know that you don't have exactly uh favorable opinions on the fed i've seen you wear hats called <laughs> end the fed so i know where you stand <laughs> i got one bro. too yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> love a hat like that yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll trade you for a value attainment hat but basically he testified in front of congress and here are some of the highlights of that and i want to get your opinions yeah. on the other side of this so he basically said right now the number one goal is to combat inflation right so quote unquote Jerome Powell says the Fed has the tools and the resolve to restore price stability 
in America. Mm -hmm. Right? We understand the hardships high inflation is causing among American citizens. We are strongly committed to bringing back down inflation. He added that GDP is picking back up. Consumption is strong. But but the housing market is softening due to a spike in mortgage rates. Plus, future rate hikes are coming. I think they announced it, a couple more hikes throughout the, the rest of this year. They just raised it uh, 50 basis points, 75. I want to say. 75 basis yeah. points uh, a week ago, I want to say. Um, and then lastly, he says, but overall, the American economy is strong and well-positioned to fight inflation. So, George, <laughs> as a financial expert, yeah. would you please... Uh, help us make sense of what's going on here in America. Well, today. First of all, I don't know how the economy can be strong when in Q1 it contracted by 1.5%. Mm -hmm. So think about that. The, we, the, we have negative GDP growth right now when you adjust for inflation. So he's saying literally the economy is contracting, but it's really, really strong. <laughs> so I always call it an, a recessionary boom, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably how the media and the administration is going to spin it. But another thing that he said in there, uh, a couple of the you know the politicians asked him about the probability of a recession. And he says, "Well, you never really know." He said, "No one can really predict a recession, and uh, you know we've never been able to do it in the past, so no one can do it now." Mm -hmm. And that's just utter nonsense because we have something called a yield curve, right. and it's when you look at the Treasury curve, especially the twos and the tens. So it's the two-year Treasury mm -hmm. and the ten-year Treasury. Going back to 1950 or so, when that thing inverts, you've got almost a 100% probability that you get a recession within 18 to 24 months. Wow. And so we've had that curve actually invert twice in the last maybe three or four months. So th that that is just patently false when he says that no one can predict a recession. Maybe the Fed can't predict a recession, uh, but that yield curve sure can. And so now, does that mean that there's a 100% probability that we get a recession? No, but it's just something that's had a very high predictive ability in the past. So it's something we should really pay attention to. Uh, another thing is, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but something called the Eurodollar future curve uh, inverted to December of 22. So what that's saying is the really smart money is betting that the Fed will actually start lowering rates in 2022. Not, not raising them actually lowering rates and the only reason they would do that is because the stock market crashes like we saw in uh in march of 2020 or we get a recession uh, potentially a depression we get two or three quarters of negative real gdp growth and that's why they'd start dropping rates now what's interesting is how do they do that if the negative gdp growth is a result of an inflationary recession Right. So if you've got so if nominal GDP is going up by, let's say, five percent, but inflation is running at six percent, mm -hmm. that's negative one percent when you adjust for that rate of inflation. We call it real uh, GDP, real GDP. Mm -hmm. So if real GDP is negative, but yet it's still highly inflationary, you know, can they drop rates down to zero again? Can they do more quantitative easing? This has been their game plan for the last two or three decades. But they've always executed that plan with the backdrop of disinflation, mm -hmm. where inflation was actually going lower. So they're kind of, they've painted themselves into a corner where if we get a recession that's inflationary, the, the tools in their toolkit will only make things worse, right? So it's like you've got to choose. Do you want to prop up the economy or uh, do, do you want to uh, fight inflation? Because you can't have both. Right. And so I think it becomes a political question where the politicians say, OK, we've got to choose between the stock market and inflation. And so what are we going to choose based on the highest probability of getting reelected? And uh, I think it, it's kind of on a month by month basis. I don't know if I could project out to determine, you know, it's, I think it's going to be really narrative based. So if I'm the administration and let's say uh, inflation uh, it goes down, it's at 8.6 right now, headline mm -hmm. CPI. So let's say it goes down to 7%. I think they want to bring it down, their goal is to 5% by the end of the year. I mean, goals. yeah, yeah. So it, it, well, if it's trending down, they mm -hmm. can say, well, look what we've done to combat uh, Putin's price hikes. You know, they always blame it on Putin or something. Of course. Uh, it has nothing to do with the fact that our money supply increased by 25% in 2020. But they'll say that at least it's going in the right direction. We're, we're doing things, you know, vote for me because we've really got a handle on mm -hmm. inflation. And we're sticking it to those greedy capitalists that are just raising prices for no reason other than just to screw the poor and middle class. That's kind of going to be the narrative. So let me ask you, who, 
who's the voice of reason right now? Who can the American people trust to be like, all right, this is actually what's happening? Because you have people like uh, Michael Burry coming out and basically saying he's the guy that called The Big Short in 2008, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, if you saw the movie The Big Short, yeah. Christian Bale famously played him. You have Kiyosaki, who's I feel like is always calling for some sort of reset. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, even Patrick Bet David has brought this up. You, it seems like you're indicating that, you know, with the uh, the yield curve, the potential recession yeah, is coming. I just did a video about that, right? A, about being prepared. A major for video, it. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I, I think you you just listen to the to the bond market, because historically the bond market is smart money. The stock market's dumb money. Mm -hmm. So you just look at the ten year, the thirty year. I mean, the the since the Fed raised rates by 75 basis points. Initially, the 10-year spiked up slightly, but now it's just gone down, down, down. Look at the gold market going down, oil market going down, although it's mm -hmm. still very high. Those are going down. That tells you that people, the smart money is betting that we're gonna have a recession. So there are no certainties, there are only probabilities. Uh, but right now, if I was someone with a sizable portfolio, I would mm -hmm. be positioning for taking advantage of asset prices going lower in the future. Okay, so let's stop right there. So, you know, they always say buy the dip, buy the dip, yeah. right? You know, yeah, so yeah. Um, if you're an average American, right, you're making 50 grand a year, maybe, you know, you've got your head on, you know, you got some investments, you're saving, you've got some debt, you're trying to get rich on crypto, you know, you hear this recession talk, you got smart guys like George Gammon Bain saying, hey, you know, prepare yourself for this. What tangible action steps can the average American do? to really prepare for this because yeah. for instance yeah. you know what they talk about is you know obviously asset allocation diversification you know the whole like 80 20 rule if you're 80 have 20 percent in stocks 80 percent in bonds yeah. and if you're 20 have 20 percent in bonds 80 percent stocks it's kind of like mm -hmm. i always try to you know dumbify investing for for people that don't get it and essentially it's like the younger you are have more stocks the older you are have more bonds but that's just my uh, dumbed down approach, but like yeah, that, but it makes sense. I got a question for yeah. you too, as yeah. well. Is uh, why do you, I, I don't think I've asked you this before. Why did you think that the crypto market has bottomed out or has fallen out of it right now? Well, there's a rule that I learned from uh, my investment hero, is a guy named Jim Rogers, mm -hmm. and he says you always sell hysteria mm -hmm. and buy panic. Yeah. So you'll notice when when Bitcoin got over 45,000, you know, 50,000, 60,000. You saw hysteria everywhere. I mean, just go on Twitter. You know, if you were to even mention that there might not be a 100% probability mm -hmm. that Bitcoin was going to a million dollars. To 100,000 is what they're saying. 100,000 by the end of by the yeah. end of 2021. Yeah, you would have been never absolutely crucified. Mm -hmm. You had people saying that you should take out a mortgage on your house to buy Bitcoin. You right. had people saying that you, Leverage should, it. Yeah. you should max out your credit cards to well, buy Bitcoin. Well, in November, it, would, it got up to 69,000, and that's when it started to teeter off. Yeah, so you, you just use that as a rule. So even if you're long-term Bitcoin, nothing goes up in a straight line. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Right. So then what you do is you wait for panic to add to your position. So what would panic look like? Mm -hmm. If you get a guy like Michael Saylor having to sell, if you stop seeing all the commercials on CNBC. <laughs> Another thing that I'm, yeah. you know, the Bitcoin conference is here mm -hmm. in Miami, as yeah. you guys know. In June, mm -hmm. yeah, I was there. Yeah. yeah, so one of the things that I'm doing is I'm trying to monitor the ticket sales for the Bitcoin conference. So let's say last year they had 15,000 in ticket sales. Next year, if they have 5,000, okay, now I'm, now I'm getting interested. And if the year after that they have 1,000, now I'm really, really interested. Mm -hmm. Because they, you know, Bitcoin's dead, oh, no one would, in their right mind would buy cryptocurrency. That's panic, and that's when you want to consider buying again. It's just like real estate in 2012. Mm -hmm. you know, I retired in 2012, and I went uh, you know, head first into real estate, and everyone was telling me that I'm crazy. George, don't you know that real estate always goes down? It never goes up in price. It's been coming down <laughs> since 2006. It's the worst thing you can possibly invest in, mm -hmm. right? When you start hearing that, you know you're onto something. I mean, that's one of kind of my rules of investing is just go ahead and tell your friends and family members your idea. If they say, oh my gosh, that's a fantastic idea. How can I do that? You know that you probably want to right. rethink that, right? But if they tell you that you're absolutely out of yes. your mind, that's probably going to be a winner. By the way, I 100% agree with what you're saying because it goes to speak of what you know the what Warren Buffett says is that be greedy when people are fearful and be fearful when people are greedy. You know, yeah. on CNN they have what's called the fear and greed index. I don't know if you can just Google fear greed mm -hmm. index. We covered this on PBD podcast the other day. 
but essentially what you're saying is do the freaking opposite of what everyone else is telling you to do. Like yeah. if you get in an Uber and your Uber driver is like, yeah, you know, I just got some Cardano and Solano and I'm buying a I'm GameStop and I'm doing all this. It's like, GameStop. it's like, what? You, you don't. Yeah, or at least that's where you can or, be a little at least fearful. Wait to add to your position. Extreme fear. This is this is what's the, this is what's called the <laughs> sentiment century theaters. that's moving the market right yeah. now. Right? What emotion is driving the market now? If you looked at this in 2020, sorry, maybe 2021, what after all the printing and the quantitative easing and the buying of bonds and all that fun stuff, it was extreme greed, mm. right? Mm. Dogecoin well, was worth 50 in cents. In 2021, and, yeah, yeah, it would have been extreme greed. So what this is telling you is short term, they, may, they there might be a buying opportunity, but it all depends yes. on your time horizon. 100%. You know, are you trying to guess what's going to happen in three months or six months? Or are you trying to say, okay, what are the probabilities of X, Y, Z event happening in five years, 10 years? Yes. And I'm going to go ahead and just build a position slowly based on hysteria and panic. Well, talk about that, George, because I mean, our average person in the audience is 25 to 30 years old. Yeah, There's some people yeah. younger, some people older. You know, I'm, I kind of call myself more of a personal finance expert. I'm not a macro economist. I, if you make 50 grand, you make 100 grand, you make 200 grand. Come talk to Saz. I tell you exactly what you need to do. And I'm a decade trader. I'm not a day trader. I started yeah, investing. Okay, exactly. Love that. I started investing in 2008, right at the beginning or the onset of the recession, 2009, 2008. Mm -hmm. And everyone would ask me, like, how much money did you lose? I was like, nothing. I have no money. And like, I just started. Um, but I've seen my portfolio go from 100 grand to 500 grand to a million and, the, and so on and so forth. But I've waited my turn. I haven't got greedy. I haven't sold anything. And, you know, in the Bitcoin community, they talk about HODL or HODL, right? You're mm. familiar with this? Bitcoin and HODL. And if you bought Bitcoin when it was at five grand or 10 grand, you're winning right now. And maybe you sold when you were at 60 and, you know, yeah. kind of saw the panic mm -hmm. there. But just talk about the principles of investing. Like, hey, guys, George Gammon here. I kind of know what the, I'm doing. Here are some key elements that you should understand. Number one rule is don't try to guess which direction the price is going. Mm -hmm. And that's what everyone does. That's, that's their starting point. They ask themselves, okay, Bitcoin or real estate or the S&P 500, is it going up or down in price? That is unknowable. Right. And uh, Stan Druckenmiller only gets it right 55% of the time. Yeah. So if he's getting it right only 55% of the time, trust me, you're not going to get and it tell right. tell our friends who Stan Druckenmiller is. He's one of the greatest investors of all mm -hmm. time. Uh, in fact, his track record as a hedge fund manager is probably the best. Uh, of all time and he's done it through multiple mm -hmm. decades bear markets bull markets you name it okay so number one don't guess what the s p is going to do or just the price of something right. and that's where everyone starts they always ask me you know on my live streams george you know do you think real estate is going higher should i buy a house right now or should i wait you know that's a price question mm -hmm. instead of what you want to do is understand that it's completely unknowable but what is knowable is asking the question is it cheap or is it expensive, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at a long-term chart of oil adjusted for inflation, you can see that when it gets under $30 a barrel, it's cheap. When it gets over 80, 85, it's expensive. So simply wait until it gets cheap and buy it. And then when it gets expensive, sell it. Don't try to figure out the price. Mm -hmm. And a great example of this, a uh, couple, in 2012, when I went uh, you know, head first into real estate, I actually thought the prices were going lower but I still bought. Why? Because it was cheap. I wasn't trying to guess the price direction. And out of that portfolio I bought in 2012, I started selling those houses in 2018. Did I think the price was going up? Probably, but I sold anyway, because I'm not trying to guess the price direction. It just got expensive, you see? And, and how that, do you gauge, like just based on your own sentiment of it, whether it's expensive or no, cheap? No, you just look at a chart of okay. a, a, an inflation adjusted chart of aggregate real estate in the United States going back to 1900. And it's you can find that chart simply just Google search and you can see when it gets expensive. You can see it's historic trend line. And uh, you know another example was March 2020 uh, when oil got, it was right around 20 bucks a barrel. I thought it was going to 10. I, didn't and it get to zero at some point? They or were to negative $38 yeah. okay, a barrel exactly. you know, in the futures market. But I thought it would go lower, but I bought anyway. Uh, why? Because it was cheap. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I sold oil at uh, probably 85 a barrel. Did it go higher? Yeah, absolutely it did. But I wasn't trying. That's not the question I was trying to answer. So what you're doing there is you're, you're getting the probabilities 
or you're playing to the probabilities, you've got a positive edge. So mathematically, if you have an edge, the longer you employ that strategy, the higher likelihood that you actually make money. Very similar to blackjack. Uh, I started playing blackjack in the early 2000s and learned how to count cards, and it was very beneficial really? in my entrepreneurial career. So Absolutely. You're, you're like Zach Galifianakis in The Hangover, just like uh, Rain I Man I believe vibes. that. I believe you <laughs> could. Well, I, I, yeah. I used to do that stuff. But it, so it you're really, counting cards at the blackjack table. It trains your brain wow. to think in terms of probabilities. Mm -hmm. And the you know a lot of people, when I, sold, when I started selling real estate in 2018 as an example, they'd say, oh boy, you've really got to be kicking yourself right now because you missed out on all of those gains. Nothing could be further from the truth because I played correctly based on the probabilities, you see? So the example I use in blackjack terms, mm -hmm. it's like you're in Vegas with a buddy of yours and you know, you, you've had a few drinks and they're doing shots of tequila and yada, yada, yada. You know how to play blackjack, they don't. The kid gets a, a 19, let's say. And uh, he's like, you know what? I think I'm going to hit because I think the dealer is showing it too. bro. <laughs> and you're like, you know, that's not a good idea. Uh, just trust me. Oh, George, yeah. you're being too conservative. What do you know? Oh, you're always, you know, trying to play with your stupid probabilities. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and hit. I'm feeling lucky. So let's say they hit, they get a two, yeah. and they get 21, they get blackjack. Did they do the right? Go, I told you so, George. Yeah. You see, mm -hmm. that's right. It's logic it's versus emotion, which obviously the that's rational right. male, we could speak yes. on what but, logic but Never tell me the odds. <laughs> but but yeah. the question is, did they do the right thing or the wrong thing? And I would argue they did the wrong thing yeah. because they have a negative edge based on the probabilities. So if they do that continually, there's a 100% uh, chance that they go bust. Mm -hmm. They will absolutely go bust. So that's how I, I tend to look at uh, investing. And it would just blow your mind the percentage of retail investors that don't think in those terms. They, they think in terms of price direction, which is unknowable, instead of cheap and expensive, which actually is knowable. Mm -hmm. All right, the final question of this segment, and then obviously I want to get Rolo's thoughts sure, on sure. On everything that's going on right now, because we're kind of no, in his I'm learning, man. Yeah. I feel like I'm in I, class. I, I agree. Is awesome. I, by the way, I watch him, by there, the way, there's so many people, and believe me, I'll, I'll cue this up for, for Rolo, but people are always like, you talk a lot about dating and relationships that's on Thursday. your money show. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's kind of all intertwined because guys want to make True. money. Why? So they can have nice things, they can take out women and kind of do it. Like, if, like, if you ever go to a, a, a boys' private school, right? All boys school, they don't dress nice. They don't give a shit how they're looking. They don't comb their hair. Why? Because there's no women to impress. Right. Men make money mm -hmm. so they can look good for women. Yeah. Or have things to take women out or have a nice car for women. I mean, you could probably well, speak the, to this. The, the, the thing that there's three things that have defined powerful men over the course of history. OK, mm -hmm. like like dynastic emperors of China, uh, you know, Caesar, you know, whoever. Um and, and it doesn't have to be that. I mean, it could be like the tribal chieftain in the Amazon rainforest of some tribe, right? There's three things. It is uh, access to, um, to territory, having mm -hmm. territory, access to, um, to resources, so you, you know, being able to defend that territory and to use that, those resources, and then access to uh, exclusively you know, virginic women, like to have a mm -hmm. harem, right? Uh, like so those the, are the three. Well, territory. those are the territory, and then being able to reproduce and know that the reproduction is going to the paternity investment in that to know that those kids are going to be yours. Territory, so that's, resources, and fertility. Well, yeah, I mean, we look at like China. It's like the Forbidden City. It's guarded by eunuchs, right? Because they want to make sure that when the emperor goes to have his time with the with the concubines, that the any children that are produced are his children. Right. right. So. Um, and then if you go and you look throughout history, I don't care if it's like the Yanomamo tribe from wherever or can be like the, you know, um, uh, t tribal societies to the most advanced societies of, of man. And nowadays we don't have, you know, emperors and everything else. But by order of degree, the three things that have defined powerful men over the history over history have been resources, territory and access to to a lot of women so that you can reproduce more more so mm -hmm. than any uh, any of your competitors. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a huge macro story. And most people in the macro space totally miss this uh, because they're just not plugged in to kind of the the red pill dynamics that Rollo talks about. But if you think about it in terms of demographics mm -hmm. and what's happening with dating right now, this mm -hmm. is huge. This is absolutely huge. And it's going to impact the macroeconomic story for decades to come. You know, what, what's happening with 60% uh, of the college students right now being women. 
Mm-hmm. That, that's a mm-hmm. huge macro story. Mm-hmm. And most people are just ignoring it uh, in, in my space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, the perfect segue to what I want to talk about, because you've talked a, a couple of weeks ago was in Davos, the World Economic Forum. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's our what's our friend's name? Klaus Schwab. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Klaus, oh, Klaus, oh, Klaus, oh, <laughs> telling people that you will have nothing and you will Eat like bugs. it. Eat bugs. <laughs> yeah. You will yeah. have Eat nothing bugs. and you will like it, George. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nothing is what you'll do for. <laughs> anyway... Um, you talked about population control with that. And I, yeah. I feel like I have the literal best panel in the world right now to talk about this subject. But let's get into that in the in that context right there with Rolo. So one of the things I love about capitalism is you've got choices. You've got options, baby. I know you're, I mean, the rebel capitalist. I know yeah. that you're a fan of capitalism. Um, women have options these days. You know, the question is, do they actually need men anymore they might want men but you know why do you need a man if you can go out and go to college and do it yourself and get a job and make your money you don't need that i mean women are making money too unlike 40 50 years ago it was crazy right here and i'm gonna tee this up i I heard a song recently and i was like oh shit i remember this song it was dolly parton Mm. 1980 yeah uh uh, nine to five. Working nine to five. Working nine to yeah, five. It was a movie. What yeah. a, it was a movie, but it was also a song. Jane Fonda, I believe. Lily and Tomlin. Lily, Lily Tomlin, Tomlin and Jane. Three yeah. working yep, yep. women in 1980. Well, I'm sure my age. Basically plotted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you were a young boy. Well, I at that remember. Point. Yeah, I was very. They young. plotted to kill their boss because he was kind of a chauvinist, and basically, it could have been before that. But this is my longest frame of reference. 1980. Essentially, that. Essentially started the women's uh, female empowerment movement on a on a mass scale in the movies. I'm saying like that pop culture. So, what has that led to? And this is something that you're gonna just pick this up and run with it. Uh, women freezing their eggs, the mm-hmm. pill, you know, mm-hmm. birth control. Yeah. Corporations encouraging abortions because they want basically workers, not family women, right? Because mm-hmm. you know, profits. Like you talked about, the government pandering to women because 60% of women are college students, mm-hmm. and two thirds of people with student debt are females. So mm-hmm. you know, eliminate student debt, you get 1. the female 7 vote. One point seven trillion dollars. There you go. Yeah. Um, and you taught me something about that too. You also know. talked about a post-marriage society, right, where it's the lowest marriage rates ever in the United mm-hmm. States. I think women tend to be 28, and men the birth are 30. Rates plummeting. Birth, the birth, birth rates, rates are plumbing. plumbing. By the way, in Europe, I think it's even a bit older. Oh, it's worse than that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then also a decline in sex. Mm-hmm. So. I'm just teeing all that <laughs> <For> up. For men. <laughs> yeah. co- okay. Yeah. So if you would, just weigh well, in sure, on everything sure, sure. I just talked if, about if you, right there. If you look at the Davos types, yep. the, the global elite, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, they've really got three main objectives. And, and I could go into great, great detail on this. But uh, their first objective is to reduce the energy consumption mm-hmm. at a global level. Uh, their second, because they're all Malthusians. Their second objective. Explain what Malthus yeah, is. Yeah, you need to break that one down. Okay, so Thomas Malthus mm-hmm. was uh, an individual that lived in the 1800s, and he was the first person to articulate this view that if you have exponential population growth in a world of limited resources, you're going to run into some big problems. The only mm-hmm. release valve there will be the standard of living. So you need to proactively try to reduce energy consumption, and you need to proactively reduce the birth rate. The, as your duty as a good proactively how though through war Having, through famine what well, used to well, be well used so be he war. had two kind of levers there yeah he said let's embrace war let's embrace famine because it brings down the population to where it's at equilibrium with our resources which is effed up you know mm-hmm. obviously as it is. Uh, and then he said uh, and then let's also try to limit the number of kids we have instead of having three or four let's just have one or two mm-hmm. and we, and china and you know, the largest uh, and, you know, one, all these one kid for however many decades it used to be the one, one child chi- policy is right. gone now but yeah clearly because yeah, that, that was a very malthusian type type of view which okay. and, and also you know there the, the club of rome is what really kind of got these ideas going again in the 1970s with a paper called limits to growth that came out in 1972 and the person that wrote that paper was actually the keynote uh pre presenter at Davos at mm. the World Economic Forum by Klaus Schwab. What year in was that? 1973. The first that was the first year or was 71? 71 was the, was the okay. first year. 72 the limits to growth came out Got and it. 73 the gentleman was the keynote speaker at Klaus's event. So and then the third thing is they just want to usurp power, control and wealth because they figure that's the way that they're going to achieve those first two objectives and anything else that they want to do. So I think when you look at things through that lens, you know, you ask yourself, why is the Davos type always pro woke agenda? Hmm. Let's say, 
right? Uh, why is it that they're always in favor of Disney saying that 50% of their characters are going to be LGBTQ, whatever it is now, right? Um, it's, it's, I'm not saying that they're behind that, mm -hmm. but they're really cheerleading it because it helps them achieve that second objective. You know, they don't care. What's the second object objective? Reduce the birth rate. Yeah. Reduce the they don't rate. care about women uh, being empowered. You know, they just say they want that because that's going to reduce the birth rate. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. that uh, women being empowered or 60% of the university students being women is a bad thing. I'll, I'll let that, you know, you be the judge. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that there's a cost benefit that needs to be done. And you have to realize that if there's a benefit, fine, but the cost is going to be lowering the birth rate. If we lower the birth rate, that's going to create macroeconomic problems mm -hmm. in the future. Let's go complete, like, different angle right now. Not different angle, but um, the good, bad, and ugly, basically. Give me, like, if you're a member of the globalist elite Davos, mm -hmm. give me, like, the reason that it's a necessity to have this meeting and what the, all the benefits are. Give me that. And then give me the counterpoint of like, give me the most evil, <laughs> you know, darkest secret of what they're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. liberals eating baby. Give me just the most positive and the most negative from this World Economic Forum yeah. in Davos. I don't know what the positive and negative is, the extreme, yeah. but I've done a lot of research on this. I just did a presentation at a, at a live event a, a couple weeks on it, uh, or a couple weeks ago on it. And I think that... Uh, it all goes back to one chart. And if you look at a chart of energy use since 1800s, mm. it explains everything. So what happened in 1800, about 99% of our energy came from uh, biofuels. So basically dried cow dung and, and lumber. And then we got coal, and then we had oil, and then we have natural gas, and then we have renewables, and we have nuclear, Fracking. we have all these things, right? So what you see starting in about the 1950s is the amount of energy we use goes exponential. Mm -hmm. Now, the, pop the global population follows the exact same curve as does global GDP growth. So you have to come to the conclusion that, that energy is the economy. And energy is what allows the population to continue to flourish, all right? Well, if you're looking at this f through that Malthusian lens, you're saying, okay, at some time uh, in the near future, this resource or these resources that we have access, that's got a flat line. So that means that if the population continues to grow exponentially, the standard of living has to go down. So we need to take it upon ourselves to pull those first two levers to make sure that we buy enough time for renewables to not only replace, see, see that's a complete misnomer. Renewables can't just replace the existing fossil fuels. They have to add to it because let's go back to biofuels. Every single time that we get a new energy source that's superior, we don't stop using the last energy source we had. Uh, we, in fact, often use more of it. So today, uh, we're using more biofuels than we did in 1800. We're using more coal. We're using more oil. And so it, th those energy sources just grow. And again, that's what allows the population to grow. So the global elite look at this and say, okay, well, we've got to kick the can further down the road to allow renewables to not only replace but add to the level of energy we have access to right now. So we need to manipulate the, po the uh, global po population to use, we need to condition them to use less energy. And then also, if we can lower the birth rate, then we're going to have more energy per capita and we can buy more time. And then I think the fringe benefit there is that uh, if we get into a situation where they're just not able to create enough energy by conditioning the public to use less, it allows them to use more. So as my good friend Chris Martinson always says, they want you to take a cold shower so they can continue to fly around the world in their mm, private jet. Mm. You know, something like this. And so not only do they have this Malthusian view, but they have a, a, a it, it's, in my opinion, it's borderline uh, eugenics, eugenics yeah. where, uh, you know, a eugenicist believes that there's a group of people that are just superior right. and the rest of those people are just inferior. So if we could just weed out those people that are inferior, that would be better for society long term. So if you think about your typical central planner, right, Marxist, let's say, or socialist, 
they they don't they might not go that extreme, but it's a very similar view that there's a group of people that should be calling the shots for everyone else because that group of people is just better at making decisions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I would suggest looking at that problem of that exponential growth curve in energy or a Malthusian view is I'd say, listen, we need more free market capitalism because if we have an extra 2 billion people on earth, great. That's an extra 2 billion people that can solve these problems mm -hmm. that are real. But they can't handle that because in their worldview, they're the smartest people on the planet. So if they can't fix the problem, well, you dumb rubes out there in society can't fix it either. So to make sure that we've got the best chance of fixing this, we need to usurp the power. We need the control. We need the wealth. And it's just for the greater good. But let me ask you, because there's something that's conflicting in my mind right now is because... Can I, can I just yeah, interject sure. here real quickly? Because when we're talking about eugenics, um, eugenics is a... I mean, we, if you think about like selective breeding and stuff like... I have I have two greyhounds, right? And, and over the years, it's like, we want this particular type of dog, so we're going to breed these dogs together. And, mm -hmm. that's, and, the, and we can take direct control over that. Now, there was a certain political party back in the 1930s that I'm not going to name because we're on YouTube... Um, who took direct control. And that's how we even know what mm -hmm. eugenics is as a term. We think of it as like, oh, it's this really evil connotation that goes with it. You want, you want an evil, here we go. Um, but we can't take direct control of that, uh, of quote unquote eugenics right now. But we also have to take into account what are the, um, what are the components to, to effectively t do eugenics without doing eugenics, right? Well, who has to come together to to create a child, right? Well, we've got the man and the woman. So who is the incubator of the next generations right now? If we want to affect gene eugenics, we've got to find some way to either convince one party, the male party, to take control, or we have to convince the other party, who is the incubator of the next generation, to direct them in the way that we would like them to go. So it's not quite eugenics in the sense that we're like taking direct, you know, tyrannous control over that, but we're just sort of pushing them in the right, putting, pushing women in lar at large, you know, in Western society, well, really in any societies, towards where we want them to go. Yeah, that's very, very interesting because yeah. that, that rabbit hole goes really deep. Yeah, uh, we talked about that on your show. Yeah, actually. because if you think about uh, kind of the Marxist ide ideology, one of the things they understood is that they would have to kind of re-hardwire people's brains because Condition, just naturally, psychological condition. Yeah, naturally we're going to pursue our own self-interest mm -hmm. and the interest of our family. So how do you breed people that don't have their own self-interest as their number one priority mm -hmm. and have the interest of the state? Right. right? Of the state or the greater good? It's, well, is both, that the same you know, thing? One and the same, yes. or, 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 you know, that don't have the priority as, you know, whatever the global elite say it should be. So if, and I'm not saying this is true, but it's very interesting mm -hmm. that if they're able to take that decision-making process as far as, the, you know, how the next generation mm -hmm. is going to be brought up and mm -hmm. put that in uh, on and the social, shoulders social engineering of, of is, people yeah. who are more favorable to socialism mm -hmm. historically, uh, then you're kind of achieving that mm -hmm. objective and you're making the population more malleable mm -hmm. or more open to your ideas where if you had the, these kids in the next generation being brought up by people that were very individualistic mm -hmm. and pursued their own self-interest, believed in free market capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, then it's going to be much tougher to, to crack that egg. And I can I can go you one better. You, you want to go down the evil Let's rabbit go, hole here? So we go. We're going to get real evil today. Um, so. The way I've broken this down, and I'm actually considering writing a book about this, and maybe we should co-author it, actually. Um, for for men, and you've probably heard uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson talk about this, and, and God saw it. I know you guys just had yeah. on here as well. Um, from an evolutionary psychology perspective, men tend to think in terms of dominance hierarchies. Yeah, so right, when right. I talk about like capitalism versus like I don't I, I don't use socialism. I use communitarianism. I use um, social dominance hierarchies men tend to think in terms of hierarchies i think i've brought this up before on this show where it's like you've got the uh, the general at the top and mm -hmm. then you've got the lieutenant and then your corporal and then the sergeant on down the line of chain of command we see that same structure in team sports we see that mm -hmm. same structure in in our our workplace so the there's general the, manager the head yeah, coach the, the exactly team all the way on down the line and men tend to organize societies based on dominance slash 
competence hierarchies. Right. So when we have a president and we have the cabinet and with vice president and everything, all, every, even from our, our government structure is still based on a masculine, you know, dominance hierarchy, competence hierarchy. Which is free market capitalism. Yeah. And when men, when men organize societies or when men uh, distribute resources, it tends to be based on, perf ideally, it yeah. tends mm -hmm. to be based on performance. So, a meritocracy? It, right. Yeah, That's more right. or less. So what happens is it's like, okay, um, they've done these experiments where they will take uh, a, a, a finite amount of resource and they'll give them to a group of just exclusively men and then they'll give it to, to exclusively women. And for men, what they do is they say, okay, John, you did a better job than Joe over here, so you get you get 10 bucks. And Joe, you did a pretty good job, so we're going to give you five bucks. And Jim, you know, Steve, whatever, we're going to give you a buck and you get three bucks. You did, you know, based on whatever your performance was or what everybody says, this is what you're worth kind of thing. Mm -hmm. For women, when they have uh, resources that are given to them, it's very communitarian. Mm. This goes back to our hunter-gatherer tribes uh, sort of psych psychology. And when women get, are receive the, those those resources, they don't do it hierarchically. They go one for you and one for you and one for you. Oh, and Jill, you're pregnant, so two for you and one for you and one for you and one for you. And so it's much more egalitarian. Uh, communitarian is a much more feminine way of thinking about organizing societies. Now, think about where we're at as far as like, why is it a good idea when Andrea Ocasio, Alexandria Ocasio, AOC AOC. says, oh yeah, um, we're going to entertain the idea of democratic socialism. Well, that seems like a very good idea when it is women that are primarily organizing society or organizing government or are in control of the purse strings. They tend to look at things in terms of the greater good in those terms is whatever works for women and you can see even nancy pelosi has talked about this several times in like the nate or the un uh women's forum where she says you know if i ran the world i would make sure that you know women's issues were the, the top priority number one thing and i'm like well you have just basically cut off half of the world's population by making that statement right there and it just goes in one ear and out the other they're oblivious to it not because they're being evil, it's just that it's not even an afterthought. It doesn't enter into the thought process because everything when you, women are organizing society tends to be much more communitarian because that's just how they think. So you've got a male dominance hierarchy and we've got an organization of you know the military and, and business and everything else in this capitalist society. Right. Men tend to be more capitalist. Women tend to be more communitarian, egalitarian, and socialist. So if we're trying to establish some kind of eugenics program that's not quite eugenics program it's favorable favorable to marx who what which way of organizing society works best dominance hierarchy or communitarianism to affect that that yeah, eugenics absolutely. program I mean, you just got to put yourself in the position of one of these global elite assuming that those are your three objectives and you look at the world around you and you say okay what do we want to promote through the media. I'm about to be assassinated business. after the show, too, no, by the way. <laughs> what, if our goal is global Marxism, where, where we're just calling the shots, you know, how do we get how do we get from a point A to point B mm. using the entertainment business or in, let's just say influencing? I don't want to go so far as to say they control everything, you know, uh, but they influence. Right. And they influence the mainstream media. So how do we influence these groups that have massive influence on society at large to help us? have a higher probability, going back to that, of achieving these objectives mm -hmm. if our objective is to have kind of a global society that's this tops down type of approach. And in that world, uh, you would want the people making the decisions that lean more towards, uh, you know, however you want to say, or whatever your term, communitarianism. Yeah, aren't these, um, and this is the point that I was gonna kind of make earlier, this, if, to become a member of the global elite, you gotta make some money. And you're going to make that money through capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Like you said, a great quote that you said is if you want to have a, a bigger piece of the pie, well, grow the pie. I'd be, you, you, you said that on Kiyosaki's uh, Rich Dad Radio Channel. Yeah. So um, who, like, who is actually at these Davos? Because I know billionaires are there. You know, Ray Dalio famously went there and said, you know, cash is trash. Right before the pandemic, he caught a lot of heat from that. Obviously, major you know, players at different countries are there. But a lot of them are capitalists, though. So how do they justify being a capitalist, but also and even living in a capitalist society, but then sort of sounds like they're kind of indoctrinate this Marxist global agenda? Is that am I am I interpreting that wrong? Well, I wouldn't call them capitalists. I'd call them fascists. 
and and I'm not saying that in terms of uh, you know being a racist or anything like that, but more an economic fascist, where they like that private public partnership hmm. is how they always describe it. So if you're a monopolist, let's say if you're uh, you know let's say Benioff was he's the CEO of uh, Salesforce, Salesforce. Um, you know he's just like a disciple of Klaus. So it, it, through his worldview, you know why should I not buddy up with this guy? where it gives me a huge, huge competitive edge. You know, in a world where politics are very, very important, where these global governments have massive control and power at, over the purse strings, mm -hmm. you know, why? if I'm a, a corporate CEO, why should I not want to get in bed with these people? Because it gives me a massive, massive advantage and it helps me build a moat around my business mm -hmm. to eliminate any of the competition. You know, so it, it, it does give them a massive competitive edge. So that's, that's capitalism versus what you're describing as crony capitalism. Yeah, so th when I talk about capitalism, mm -hmm. you'll notice I, I very rarely ever use that term all by itself. You're like saying free market capitalism. That's right. Yeah, that's, yeah. right. that's right. Explain the difference. Free market capitalism, or when you have a free market where no one has a competitive edge, no one is being bailed out. Right. Uh, if you, it's 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 the ultimate meritocracy. What you're talking about, if you don't provide a good or a service to consumers that they're willing to pay for, then you're going bust. And what's going to happen is the people that behave more prudently, or the people that, uh, by choice of the consumer, that they're willing to spend their money with, they're going to take over the assets of the people who go bankrupt. And you know, as Milton Friedman said, uh, free market capitalism is a profit and loss system. But loss is even more important than the profit. Mm -hmm. See, and so what we're doing now is we're propping up all, I mean, go back to the GFC, you know, the global financial crisis that we had in 2008. We came in and we bailed out all these banks. We propped them up. No, no, no. Let them fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Schumpeter's creative destruction. And yes, we would have had a depression for a year or two. But then the market would have picked itself back up. The capital and the resources would have been allocated to those who are more prudent. Of course. And the economy would have been far more fundamentally sound today. Uh, but see, so what they're trying to do is gain favor with these politicians to make sure that if we do have a recession or a depression, you know, they're going to get all the handouts. They're going to get the bailouts. The bailouts, right. That's right. Mm -hmm. so like it, the airline companies, right? I mean, that's exactly. a big short. So like the... Um, exactly. Chamath Palapatiya, I'm sure uh, you're from, Not a fan? No. Um, well, he famously... This is something you probably are going to agree with, though, George, um, is that when 2020 hit and all the airlines got bailouts, he said, let them fail. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. sort of the premise Pat talks about, this, sort of the premise about capitalism is the freedom to succeed but also the freedom to fail. Yeah. Like, hey, you fucked up, buddy. Yeah. See you later. Yeah, I, I totally agree Dems with the them. rules. So you I agree with them on that one. Well, absolutely a lot of the airline them. companies prior to 2020 and 2018, 2019, you know, after the, the Trump tax cuts, what they do with all their the extra additional capital? They did stock buybacks, right? So they didn't have to do that. They could have, uh, you know, kept cash on deck yeah, or what have yeah. you. So what do you agree but, with on that? And what do you disagree with Chamath on that? Well, I agree they should have gone bust. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and let's take it a step further. Then what happens? So then all the ma uh, the airlines come in with these mandates, which were just crazy. Mm -hmm. And why were they doing that? Well, put yourself in the position of a CEO. You know that the government yep. uh, now can effectively shut down the entire global economy. Mm -hmm. They can just say, you know what? We're going to lock you in a cage for a year, and you're going to go ahead and do it. So that was unprecedented. Right, talking about 2020. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're a CEO of an airline and you know your business can be shut off just instantly and you just got bailed out, so now you're beholden to whatever administration is in power. Mm -hmm. So if they tell you you're going to do a mandate or you're going to do mask mandates or whatever they tell you, basically, you're going to do because you know that they could turn off the economy at any moment, create a recession due to fear, whether it's justified or not, and you know that you could need another bailout. So it gives the government this insane control, very similar to the government that you were talking about in uh, Germany in the 1930s, mm -hmm. to where, yes, the private sector technically owned the businesses and owned the shares, 
but they were heavily, heavily influenced by the government. And we're seeing that same thing play out in the United States. And I think the global, their objective is to have that not just at a state or country level, but at a global level, hmm. where there is private ownership, but they're the, the puppeteer in the game. Hmm. Crony capital, I, I like what you're saying here, George. You don't just call it capitalism. You call it free market capitalism. That's right. There's a difference. You have to qualify it. By the way, uh, if you like the conversation that we're having today, give us a thumb up. Help, I mean, if you like the gentlemen that we have on here, Rolo Tomasi and George Gammon, in the house, dropping dimes, dropping knowledge, mm -hmm. go ahead and subscribe to Valuetainment Money. This is what we do. And by the way, uh, we're, we're doing super chats, right? So we're going to be answering mm -hmm. your questions sure. uh, towards the end of the episode. Kelly, if there's something that people are, are doing super chats, Everybody, Read it out loud. Everybody loves this panel right now. They're just—they're like, "Oh my gosh, I'm taking notes." You know what? Because they're smart. They believe in themselves, Classes and they believe in free market session. capitalism, mother yes. suckers. Yeah. So thank you for that. Anyway, we're going to be answering your questions. Do the super chat, uh, George. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm learning. We all are learning, right? And remind me too Every at the end I'm of this. I, I can give your viewers some actionable. Uh, advice for their portfolios. Hundred percent. We'll do that towards the end when we when we get into super chat questions. We can do that. Mm -hmm. um, let's. Let, speaking of our viewers, um, a lot of men, a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, you were recently on Rich Cooper. I don't know when that was a year yeah, ago, yeah, whenever yeah. it was. Yeah. And I loved what you had to say because this goes back to why I talk about dating and relationships and money and how they kind of coexist and and run parallel with each other. And uh, he said four words, bro. Four words. Do you remember the four words he said? Uh, chase excellence, not women. Yeah, right. Yes, so, absolutely. and then the women will come. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Um, you know, we were just at the CME, CME. the Conference for mm -hmm. Masculine, Masculine Excellence. Excellence, right? Yeah. So, uh, women want a catch, right? Like, I always, uh, my mom is. They want uh, the whole package. They want the whole package. They want an excellent man. They want a catch, right? So, you should be focusing on personal growth, getting better, and things will come. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Rolo, speak mm -hmm. at what it what does it take to be a high value man, an oh, excellent man these again. days? I mean, this okay. is your wheelhouse, and the guys. I, mm -hmm. I look. I assume everyone here is watching because they want to get faster, smarter, better, right. wealthier, right. cooler, they sexier. Right. They if they're to. going to compete in the marketplace that's, of business and the sexual marketplace, right. so speak to that. I think we want. use the term chase a little bit too too much these days. Um, when we talk about chase, it makes me think of like little boys running after girls on the playground when they're mm -hmm. like in third grade or something. Like, Don't chase per, girls, pursue, chase excellence. Pursue yeah. excellence. Well, it, so, what you what, like? so what is excellence to mm -hmm. you, I think, is the first thing that guys need to understand. Like what, what, what does that consist of? Does that mean you're making a lot of money? Does that mean you're going to be the you know, CEO of a company, what, what does that look like to you? Because excellence in a lot, I mean, maybe you're, maybe you're the quarterback of a football team. That's excellence, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it, I think that's the, the first thing you need to define is what, what is excellence to you? What is, uh, you know, what are you passionate about? What do you make money doing? That's fine. You know, what do they say? You know, like if you have a talent or something, it's, it's one thing to have a talent. It's another thing to be able to develop that and to actually use that talent. And to, I mean, there's plenty the world's, f you know, there's graveyards full of talented men who had mm -hmm. all kinds of you know God given gifts that never did anything with it, and so there's that aspect. I think of that's it a as literal well. quote. I don't yeah, know something saying. like that. But I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. I mean, it's like you can you can be a genius, and if you don't know how to put that genius to work, or maybe it's being exploited, maybe you that's your definition of how am I going to uh, be quote unquote be excellent to each other. Um, but Bill and Ted, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. You're really showing me. Really sh oh, hey, not, not quite so much. Um, but uh, I think that that's the, that's number one. And then the other thing, of course, is I I thought you were going to say money, muscles, and game, and then the whole package is frame. Mm -hmm. um, that's essentially in the men's self improvement uh, sphere, for lack of a better term. Uh, that's if those are the three dynamics that most guys either are really good in in one of those or they're mm -hmm. deficient in another. And so maybe you call that's it grossing out. In grossing, one of the well, other what parts. happens is if somebody ha is really good with like, OK, I'm not a very good looking guy, so uh, I'm going to gross out in making a whole lot of money. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Good example. Right. Uh, I, I'll, Zuckerberg. I'll never get laid, but I'm, I want to make a lot of money because I think that, you know, I lead with my wallet and, and, uh, it's mm -hmm. a sex is a transaction, but I'm okay with that. Cause I'm Bill Gates. Look at me. Right. Um, 
so there's what happens is when guys are deficient in one or, or two of those areas, they tend to gross out in another area. So you, like really super rich men tend to have like some of the worst game you'll ever know, like Bezos, for example, Elon Musk also, for example. People, I, I, I called Elon Musk a, a beta on this very show yeah, at one point. And people were like, oh my God, how can he possibly say that? Clip he's the viral, richest man in the world. And it's like, he's got to be alpha. I'm like, no, he's he grosses out in one of those areas, which mm-hmm. is he makes a lot of money, right? Um, and then there's the, you know, the guys who are like the, the fitness guys. Well, at least I can be really hot and I can be really good looking. I go take off my shirt down at South mm-hmm. beach and the women flock to me or whatever. Okay. But I, I'm, I'm dirt poor and I'm, you know, couch surfing on my buddy's, you know, couch at home. Right. Or perhaps they, um, they get, they gross out and just being like really super slick and super charming. Right. There's the, that's the game aspect of things. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the the total package that when when women say I want a guy who's got money and he's got to love his mom and he's got to you know it's this laundry list of prerequisites and you know he's got to he's got to be funny he's got to be educated he's got to be taller than me he's got to it's like just this list this laundry list of things now does that mean that if you don't have one of those things you're just absolutely screwed no but what it's going to mean is that you're going to compensate in other ways mm. so when we see a guy who's driving this big giant monster truck out there what's the first thing women say or even guys will got say a little dick. he's got to be compensating for mm-hmm. something exactly and so we think of the we think of compensation That's why I drive in Uber, those by terms the way, or only don't have a car you can't even i'm just in an uber which right comes now. back by the way to competence and dominance mm-hmm. right so uh, there, you, think of think of money, muscles, and game, and frame, and all that good stuff in terms of dominance hierarchies as well. Because there's guys who can still pull it off. Like I, I answer this question all the time. People say, "Well, Rolo, I live in a small village in you know by the seaside in Chile, and I have to be a, a, a dominant, you know, the real G, and I want to move to Miami and everything." Well, those are good aspirations, but the thing is, is like by environment and by wherever it is that you happen to be, perhaps. In terms of like the context that you are in, maybe you are the 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 top G, the top alpha guy of your village in Chile or mm-hmm. Argentina or wherever it is that you happen to be. So by 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 contextualizing it, you have to also think in terms of like, well, socioeconomically, where am I? Ethnicity, uh, civilization wise, do I, which country do I live in? And I think one of the things that we sort of get lost in with respect to the red pill and and the stuff that I do is that. We tend to think of success as being the guy who lives on a super yacht and he's draped over a Lamborghini. And it's like that's the that's the the apex of of being like the the highest order guy. Right. He chased excellence. Right. So here's his excellence. He's got a, a McLaren. Right. Well, if the red pill isn't for the guy who's driving a tractor in Oklahoma somewhere in the Midwest or whatever, If it's not for him, it can't be for anybody. And so what I've been trying to do is really sort of break things down so it doesn't matter where you are, what, you know, sort of socioeconomic class you happen to be in. Like you could be salt of the earth kind of, you know, heartland of America guy. And you can still benefit from from what it is that I talk about, what George talks about. Heck, whatever we every Thursday out here. And if it's not accessible, if it can't be for the everyman, then it's like, what are we really doing? So when we talk about chasing excellence, that's why I always say, you know, you got to what is excellence to you? Because excellence to me sitting here in Miami with with you guys, uh, men of your caliber right now, is not going to be something that the average guy, you know, watching this show is going to be, have any frame of reference for. So when we talk about excellence, it's got to be something within the context of something that you can actually achieve that you're always about. And then the other part of that is, is people always say, well, chase excellence, don't chase women. Well, the problem is, is that if you chase excellence and that's all to the exception of mm-hmm. everything else, that's why I was mentioning, you know, grossing out in one side. If you chase excellence to the exception of everything else and everyone seems to think it's just making a lot of money or focusing on your passions or whatever like that. And it's what is it? Uh, uh, ignore women, acquire currency. I've seen that meme before. No, don't send it to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but. The idea is, is that if you have all this stuff, if you have this money and everything, then the women will come and they'll, they'll, they'll all want to flock around you. I'm like, yeah, the ones who, who are like Lauren Sanchez, who wants to get with Jeff Bezos, Gold once, diggers. once the coast is clear, Mackenzie Bezos has her $33 billion in divorce because all you were doing was chasing excellence. Mm-hmm. You have no frame of reference and no idea that you're getting rolled by a predatory woman. Well, let me ask you this, and then I want to get George's perspective. Mm-hmm. What is the perfect balance, 
Right? Obviously, well, I want to be the richest guy ever, the best well, looking guy ever, and have the best game ever. But well, it's, is there a certain I don't, I don't like, think it's, formula? I don't think it's – because when we, when we talk about like chase excellence to the exception of everything else, I don't think that that necessarily is good advice. I think we need to – you need to be focused on your – Physique, you got to mm -hmm. get your fat ass in the gym because we already know that what 75% of the American population is overweight. 35% of that, in, as far as men is concerned, are morbidly obese. Okay. So I think I'm, I feel pretty confident when I first start with get in the gym and mm -hmm. get your, get your body on point, get your physique on point. So, um, I'm, I'm probably speaking at least to 75% of the audience that's out there right now. Wow. Okay? So that's number one. Number two is so. If I'm chasing excellence and all I'm thinking about is my physique, is my is my excellence, mm -hmm. then to the exception of my money, to the exception of my, um, I, I use the term game, but really what it is, is it's social skills and social intelligence, being able to carry on a conversation like we're doing here, not only with other men, but with women as mm -hmm. well, understanding female nature, understanding men's nature, your own nature as a man as well. Um, and then understanding the the intersection between those two when we talk about intersexual dynamics, what makes you attractive, not just from your physique side of things, which is going to get you in the door. The arousal factor's got to be there. But once you get the date because you look good mm -hmm. and just bleh, falls out of your mouth, then you're 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 screwed because you didn't focus on that section of the excellence trifecta right there and if you can't pay for the date and if you have to take her to taco bell and so what you can't date coco Butte and you go on a coffee date with her or you go walking on the beach somewhere and she thinks you're a cheap ass well maybe you're not focusing on that side of excellence which is the the money side of it as well mm. yeah i think what's probably easier to do when you're trying to figure out you know how to pursue excellence <laughs> is asking yourself what is not pursuing excellence right let's just back start into there. it reverse engineer yeah, what yeah. like excellence so, so, is i like that yeah so uh, you know we're talking about defining pursuing excellence well i can tell you what pursuing excellence is not and that is chasing women so we can just go ahead and cross that one off the list you know and just kind of use uh, uh, some uh, just some principles of deduction mm -hmm. to determine okay well this is what it means to me and uh one thing I think that I would add is that you've got to somewhere in there has to be something that you're passionate about, uh, because if you're not passionate about something, uh, you know, you can you can go to the gym, you can do all these things. I strongly suggest that, but it really uh, helps if you use that as your core principle of motivation. Mm -hmm. So, as an example, you know, I happen to be very passionate about macroeconomics. So, if I was just pursuing excellence just to get a date, I probably wouldn't choose macroeconomics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to, oh, to, talk <laughs> macroeconomics to me, baby. Yeah. 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 Talk <laughs> GDP <laughs> to me, <laughs> George Cannon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but, but what's fascinating about this is that uh, in an effort just to talk about what I find fascinating, all the rest of it does come. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I go to all these uh, live events in front of thousands of people and I do this public speaking or it's true. I, I'm not Motley Crue. I'm not Vince Neil or anything like that. But you do have we have the closest thing to it right yeah. here with Rose Tomasi right, <laughs> right. There. Okay. Chris Jericho. But you, but, but, but you do have <laughs> gals that come up that, that uh, are maybe enamored might even be a, a good way to say that. Uh, Starstruck. Yeah, because because it, it's a uh, what a demonstration of higher value mm -hmm. is that the correct term? Well, I, I I think I, I, people out there are probably not going to know who I'm quoting, but I'm quoting Royce here. He says there is there are groupies for every male endeavor, yeah. except World mm -hmm. of Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because women respect leadership, they respect ambition, they respect success. Yeah, that's right. And regardless of what field yes. it's in, so I would start with a process of elimination. And then I would also try to make sure that the, the core principle there is something that you're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. What else would you eliminate, George? Like, all right, so if you're like, don't chase women, all right, like, that's cool, all right, because yeah. then you're kind of like desperate and yeah. you're that guy. What else would you eliminate? Well, Probably it's money. Disingenuous Probably money. It ends up being Chasing disingenuous. money? Yeah. You would eliminate that? Probably. Why? Because I, I, uh, I think it's like trying to figure out which direction the price is going to go. Hmm. I think if you, although that may be an objective, if it's not your priority and you focus on being an expert in one field, like, well, again, we'll use me as an example. Mm -hmm. By trying to focus on what I'm really passionate about, the money's going to come. Right. 
You know, if you get mm-hmm. to that top tier, mm-hmm. uh, the, the money, the women, the cars, the lifestyle, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll come. You know, I had a very interesting conversation with one of my best buddies who's one of the smartest guys I ever met. And this is when we were in college and we didn't have two nickels to rub together. And both of us were working at, at a golf course at the time, just working outside service, just grabbing the people's clubs when they pulled up in the car and putting them on a cart and everything, and cleaning the clubs when they got done. And back then, you know, your dream is to is to be rich and just to have money. And we're just trying to think about, you know, how do you, how is this done? And he said, I think what it boils down to is you have to ask yourself how many people in the world can do what I do. Mm. And if yeah. the answer is very few, you're going to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. If the answer is a lot, yes. you're not going to make much money at all. And that's in any really given field. So, uh, you know, in, in YouTube, if, if you can do something that very, very, very few people can do, or in the, the red pill space, yes. or in the podcasting space, mm-hmm. all that stuff is, is, is going to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just focus on what you're really passionate about and achieving excellence yeah. in that one field. And then you focus on your health, make sure that you're the best that you can be. And again, I, I think the, the, the everything just falls into place. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, and, I, and I'll. I mean, I don't mean I don't mean to rat you out, but when we were in the when we were in the car to drive over here, and I asked you, I said like, because you're in a, in a sense you're kind of like a nomad, right? You move from place to place to place. You I mean you got Medellin, of course, mm. but I asked you this. I said you don't like have a place where you like keep all your shit, right? Where you keep all your you know your cold your record collection. I think is what I said. Yeah, and you're like, no, I I just I don't have that kind. Of, you live very min- minimalistically. You you uh, move from place to place to place. And you're easily one of the richest men that I know. And you're like, I don't have, I know you bought a McLaren for a while. And then you're like, eh, I think I'm done with it now kind of thing. And I, what I find, I, and, and I was uh, having this conversation with him as well, is that um, like when I, when I look at money as far as like, um, you know, as a, as a resource, what we were saying before, it's like, you know, having a territory resource and access to women, really that comes back down to, in a sense, kind of money, muscles and game for the modern age, right? Um, but I look at money in terms of it being like a currency and I mean, I'm like, duh, it's a currency, but I mean current in like an electrical current. Like you can take that money, you can do something with mm-hmm. it. And so it's no longer about like, oh, I'm going to go buy a McLaren. I'm going to go buy this. I'm going to go buy that and have these material things. It's what can I do with the, the electrical currency, mm-hmm. like the, the power that I don't say energy, but like the, you know, the, how can I direct this? to projects or how can I direct this to experiences or how can I direct this? So like, for instance, you, you and I both know, uh, Kevin Savo, who I yep. do the NFT with. Shout right? out to Kevin when Savo. I, when I, when I first met Kevin, I'm like, this is a guy who I want to invest some of that currency yes. into rather than just sitting on top of my money and hoarding mm-hmm. it all like Scrooge McDuck. Right. And, and then I, I think sort of at the end of our lives, it's like, it's not so much about like the, the, the trophies on our shelves or the accolades we get. It's our body of work. And that body of work is really how am I going to direct that that currency into other projects? So it's not just about you know, it's nice to have a nice home, it's nice to have beautiful women, it's nice to have like you know a, a car, but ultimately that's those are just like sort of material things. I would much rather see like the life the lifestyle that I li- live help. You know, if, if I can help, I will help, but mm-hmm. I have to have money to help in the first place. And you probably heard me uh, express this before is that I'm a firm believer in, um, in enlightened self-interest. And what that means is I can't help others until I can help myself, until I'm excellent, right? Mm-hmm. I can't help other people become excellent. Or I can't help others as well as when I help myself first. And that's always been sort of a philo- philo- If I have a philosophy or an ideology, that was that's definitely it. I respect yeah, I think that. that um you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys a hell of a lot of freedom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really what we're talking about here is how do you maximize your personal freedom? Whether it's freedom to buy a McLaren, whether it's freedom to just spend the next three months in mm-hmm. Dubai, if that's what you feel like doing, or spending the next two months in Medellin, or the freedom to interact with a, a network of individuals that are, let's say, high value. You know, h- how do you do that? It, and that's really what it boils down to is really maximizing your freedom. And uh, I think that goes, goes back to doing things that you enjoy, but also within that space, providing a lot of value. 
Uh, that's one thing that I've noticed. If uh, And I just do this kind of naturally. But if you start with the objective of uh, you know being better and better and better and better, but then also providing value to other people mm. without expecting anything in return, uh, what you're going to find is that your level of freedom increases exponentially. And I think that could is really part of that uh, pursuing excellence. That's a component of it, I think. I was going to say, as I, in my, I think it's my first book, actually, I have a, a chapter in there called uh, Truth to Power. And uh, it's probably next to, next to the desire dynamic, I think it's probably one of my most quoted chapters in that book. And I, 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 I'm going to paraphrase myself here. Um, the real true definition of power is not about like, you know, controlling or domineering. Like when we think of powerful individuals, we think of like tyrants, right? We think of like people who just like crush everybody else mm-hmm. to, to, to their selfish ends, right? But really the, tr- the, the true definition of power, at least in my, my estimate, is it's the, uh, the amount of freedom that you have to, to direct the course of your life. And so if you're, if you're unable to do that or if there are, are mitigating factors that, that don't allow you to direct the course of your life, sometimes maybe that is dominating other people so that you can get done what it is that you want to do and direct the course of your life. I understand that in its most extreme, maybe negative side of things. But the, the long, you know, long story short, it's, it's the direction or the control over the direction you have over your own life. Is yeah, really I think, the definition and I think that freedom plays into your legacy. Yes. Which is what I, I think part of what you're talking sure. about. Can I say something? Sure. Uh, but, but what's crazy is I'm writing down the key words that I'm hearing right here because I have a whole six step, six principles of wealth that I'm developing, all mm-hmm. right, that I've developed, that we're rolling out a course right that. And you guys are literally highlighting each of the things that I talk about of what it is. Can I just re- reveal yeah. that what yeah, it yeah. is? So you talked about, you know, Excel, Excel, you know, don't chase money, chase. Uh, value, bring value to the market, people will pay for your skill set, right? So for instance, I work for a life settlement hedge fund. I didn't I didn't grow up and dream about this, but I'm the expert at this. I've excelled. I am excellent. I excel at yeah. this particular yeah. thing. How many people can do what you do? Very a few. handful of people, Very few. if that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like my business model is completely referrals. And like mm-hmm. you know you're good when someone calls you and says Hey, I was referred to you by so and so, and you're like, oh, you can't mm-hmm. trust so and so. You'll never. They're like, ah. Yeah. And you can joke about that. You don't have to, you know, play yourself up because you got referred. Right. But you talked about being able to do things rather yeah. than buy things. Mm-hmm. That's a major element of what we're talking about. Like, you also talked about almost minimalism, being able to travel and go where you want to go, and, you know. What I think these days is the American dream. People say the American dream is dead. The American dream is dead. The American dream is dead. I think the American dream has just changed. The American dream prior, Mm -hmm. in prior generations, our parents, whatever, was what? White, you know, house, white picket fence. social contract was really different. You know, you work at a factory your whole life. You get the gold watch, the pension, you know, two car garage, two kids, two dogs. That was what the American dream is now. Retire in Florida and the villages and play golf. Exactly. Now the American dream is essentially what George is doing, right? Is what I call you're chilling. I found myself chilling five, six years ago at age 35 where I made enough money that I could do whatever I wanted with my free time. Free, a.k.a. freedom. And when you're chilling, you can do whatever you want. I ask everybody, you talked about legacy. I say, you know, with these six principles of wealth, I say, hey, listen, before we develop these six things, only six things. You don't need to read 50 different books, take 100 different classes, get good at these six things. And number six is what I call chilling. And I say, define your chilling. And I say, everyone says the same four things. Everyone, George. Number one, I want to travel. I want to see the world. I want to see the world. All right. So after you're done traveling for a year, what do you do? Then what? Okay. Then they say, all right, well, when I get back home to the States, wherever I am, you know, I really want to pursue a passion. I'm really passionate about this. For instance, your passion, you retired in 2012. Your passion is teaching people macroeconomics. Well, you know? I, I would go, I'd say learning first and foremost. Even better, right? <laughs> Always learning being a student. Yeah. And then number three, people say they want to donate their time and give back, whether that's to homeless, whether that's Special Olympics, whether that's battered women, whatever it mm-hmm. is. But the biggest thing is creating a legacy. Mm. And everyone here on this panel is is in pursuit of a legacy. You don't write books I want to just make to a help dent men. in the universe. Exactly. Mm. And that's what yeah. essentially what we're doing right now. And I think that's what everyone needs to identify is if you had $10 million in your pocket right now, what would you do with your free time? You don't got to go to work. Yeah. All your bills are paid. You're debt free. You buy the house you want. 
what would you then do with your free time? And if you can identify that, and you can you can basically pinpoint what that Hookers is. Hookers and blow. Maybe it is. <laughs> um, then then you can kind of back into that and the reason that you're working and you know talk about pursuing a passion versus yeah. pursuing money. Um, but you need to become excellent at something. Yeah. And this end of my rant right here is that in my former life, in my early 20s, I was the jack of all trades in South Beach. Party kid, nightlife guy. Um, I was a stand-up <laughs> comedian. I just I did whatever. I was uh, like, trying to be a sports agent. I had no clarity on what I wanted to do. Rudderless. Rudderless. I mean, I was known. People knew me. Oh, there's Adam. Everyone knows Adam. I was broke as <laughs> did, shit. Didn't Patrick call you? You're no longer a party boy. You're a party now man. Now I'm a party man. Party man. <laughs> exactly. No longer, thank you, Rolo. Love that. Yeah, because I excelled at this one particular thing. I got really good at it. I'm 15 years in. I'm the VP of a major, major fund. And this is what I do for fucking fun. Mm. At this point, this is fun mm. for me. Yeah. You talked about Likewise. learning. Likewise. Yeah, I exactly. Enjoy, I enjoy exactly this. sitting down with yes. Rolo and yeah. get to pick his brain, and sitting down with George Gammon and get to pick his brain, or sitting yeah. down with PBD and get to pick his brain, or sitting down with Kiyosaki, and I get paid for that. Mm -hmm. This is fun for me, baby. Anyway, end of rant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I would do that for free. In fact, on my YouTube channel, the ninety five percent of the subscribers. And probably, I'd say, 80% of the views come from the whiteboard videos. Awesome. The mm -hmm. interviews I do really don't get that many views, and they don't get very many subscribers at all. So why do I still do them? Mm -hmm. Because I like talking to smart people. I like talking mm -hmm. to people that uh, I find fascinating. Yes. And that Rebel Capitalist show gives me the opportunity to do just that. Of course. And another I, thing that I wanna, uh, I, I'd like to point out to people that you've got to look at the world now, especially if you're a young male or even a young female, in terms of being anti-fragile. Mm. And uh, you know, the world is a very tumultuous place. Uh, I can go through and talk about charts, you know, macroeconomic charts, but even from a standpoint of a uh, personal freedom and liberty, you know, if I would have told you in 2019 that the global governments were going to lock you in a cage for a year, you'd have said that you're absolutely out of your mind. Well, okay, we saw that, and they're taking away more of our personal freedoms and liberties. And everyone asks me, well, George, what's the perfect country to go to if you want to maximize your personal freedom and liberty? And I say there is none. Because every single country is run by a socialist. You, you, you name me the country right now in the world that's not run by a megalomaniac or, some, or a socialist slash Marxist with this global agenda. There isn't any, right? So I think you need to be very nimble from a standpoint of your lifestyle. And I, I, I would argue, I'm probably not a minimalist mm -hmm. because when I, I rent a place you know, for three or four months, it's, it's not... It's pretty. You're more a little molest than I am. I got a little guitar shot. collection. It, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty extravagant. <laughs> but do you have you know? hobbies? That's what I asked him before. Because I, here's something I've realized about myself. Because, dude, I'm like, I'm looking at like a, a little older version of myself. I pray to get in George's position, yeah. you know, X amount of years down the road. But I view myself as a minimalist. I don't have a car. Yeah. Okay. I rent my apartment. I don't buy like all my. You assets. buy groceries and cook for yourself. Oh, all Instacart. Or you just go and get yeah, Instacart. I mean, I don't. <laughs> Like everything, like people are like, like I, I'm, I don't have hobbies. I don't go skateboarding. I don't do rock climbing. I don't have a card collection. I don't play the guitar. I like to do a few things. I like to make money because that gives me economic freedom to go wherever I want to go. More than anything, I like to kick it with my boys and laugh, have mm -hmm. a good time and learn. And quite frankly, I like to hang out with beautiful women and have a good time. And yeah. I have a bar in South Beach and I invite them there. That's what I like to do. And I don't have to own anything to do that. You're right. It's kind of like what you're saying is like you don't have a guitar collection. You don't yeah. have any of this kind of stuff. Explain why you're kind of a minimalist but not full-on minimalist. Well, again, it gives you that freedom. I, I think people yeah. need to remember that we're not vegetables. We, so what, what my point is mm -hmm. to say that, well, I'm going to go to Miami or I'm going to go to XYZ country and set up, you know, I'm going to plant roots there and I'm going to be there for the next 10 years or 20 years. You're, you're living like a tree. Uh, why would anyone want to do that? Mm -hmm. What I do is I say I feel like spending the next uh, three months or six months in Medellin. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, where do I want to go after that? I don't know. I'm leaving my options open because I, I'm not a vegetable. And I, also, in today's environment, I think that's very important from that standpoint of being anti-fragile. I think in the past, you could select a country and say, okay, five years, ten years from now, the country is probably going to look like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't, not even with the United States. I mean, look at what happened in Australia. 
They set these quarantine camps. Look at what happened that was one of the to worst Canada. Places. Yeah. Absolutely, Canada, which you would have said, uh, you know, in 2019 was a pretty quote unquote mm -hmm. free country. So going back to the the, the minimalist thing, the way I prefer to live is uh, let's use Medellin as an example. I spend maybe four or five months a year there, but I, I'm not locked down to it. You know, if I don't want to mm -hmm. spend time in Medellin, I, I won't do it. But I've got a staff of people, so I've got a driver. I've got a, a personal chef. I've got a gal that does all the, the laundry. I mean, I don't lift a finger to do anything. I've got my assistant down there. So I, I, I'm li literally living like a billionaire down there. Yeah, Medellin, of course. But that said, I could pack everything that I do own into mm -hmm. a couple duffel bags and go to... Uh, you know, go to podcast Hungary in, uh, or, uh, in <laughs> well, yeah, I, or go to St. Bart's for three or four months. Can I ask you a very expensive place? I've been <laughs> yeah, one of very the expensive. most. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 got, I broke up with my ex because we're like, <laughs> we're not going back there. Yeah. Um, but let me push back, if you will, because there's going to be people, people saying, well, George, hell yeah, I want to do that. But I got a wife and kids, bro. Yeah, right. So what would you say to those people? So for those people, I would set up a plan B to make sure that you can maximize the amount of freedom in your life playing the hand that you're dealt mm -hmm. or that you've got right now. So uh, sure, you might not be able to pick up and go to uh, St. Bart's in 2020 like I did just because it was the only place that w didn't have lockdowns. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can have an RV in your driveway. So if we do get riots and social unrest, which I think we'll get more of in the future, not less of, uh, then you've got a, you can pack your family up there. You can go to Pine Top if you're in uh, uh, Arizona, as an example, and just relax. You you got some way to get out of the line of fire, uh, maybe literally, and so that gives you a little bit more of that freedom. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to live, uh, you know, like a, a Doug Casey or a George Gamble? Maybe not, uh, but it's far better than what your friends are doing. To where if the riots come through your neighborhood, you're just stuck there. You're going to lock the door and maybe go down to the basement and just keep your fingers crossed. You know, that that's uh, just you're an ostrich burying your head in the sand. And I don't think that's a prudent way to live going into what I think is a fourth turning that will last until probably 2030 or so. And you talk about, um, you know, essentially what you're saying is figure out a way to get out of the rat race. Figure out a way to unplug yourself from the matrix, they'll use a red pill example, so you can be flexible. Flexibility is the new American dream or the world dream, so you could just yeah. kind of go where you want to, you know, we can get on a flight and be anywhere. This is like, we're in such unprecedented times. Yes. And you can make money from it. This is on so, your yeah, computer, I, I, on your I, phone. I can like, sit here and talk about, I can give you a hundred reasons yeah. why the economy is absolutely screwed. But I can also give you a hundred reasons as to why kids and people mm -hmm. without any money have it better uh, than anyone in, in human history. I mean, I remember I'm old enough uh, that when I was an entrepreneur, you would actually have to have five hundred thousand dollars and a, you know to set up a brick and mortar location and do all these things to start a business. It was a huge financial risk. I mean, massive. And for what? You know, to make a million bucks a year or whatever. Where now you can just buy some, you wouldn't even have to have something like this. You go on a Shopify, you just start a podcast, whatever. You, you, yeah, with my whiteboard. A couple thousand videos, bucks, you're good to go. Oh, not even. A not, laptop not with a even. webcam installed. Yeah, most, yeah. Of, most of my interviews I just do right off my laptop. Sometimes I get fancy and have that little mixer and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but the whiteboard videos, it really moved the needle the most. I just have a little whiteboard, a couple cameras, I mean, maybe $1,000 worth of equipment. And if you look at uh, kind of the monetization strategy from those YouTube videos, I'm making almost as, or maybe even more money uh, with that type of little business model than I made having to put down, you know, five hundred thousand dollars and a ten-year lease on a brick-and-mortar location and hiring all these employees and babysitting and all this responsibility. And so, and you could not have done that back in the late '90s mm -mm. or the early 2000s. You can do that now, and that's a huge What's, advantage. What, like the most, I guess. Vibrant example of that is the taxi industry. You used to literally have to put down a million dollars yeah. yeah. for a medallion in New York City to be able to have the right to drive a taxi. Yeah. And now you sign up, you have a little car, boom, you're on Uber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the gatekeeper is now gone. Yeah. Uh, which is great. By the way, we got about a, probably 20 minutes left ish of the podcast. If you're enjoying it, 
please give it a smash a like button over there for George Gammon and Rolo Tomasi today. And if, you have, if you're a member or if, you've, if you're subscribed to Valuetainment, this is a different channel. This is Valuetainment Money. We're growing this. We have experts like Rolo and George on today to bring you value. Hopefully, you're enjoying that. And then Kelly's going to be reading your super chats. Say, Let us know when you're ready. Super chat. Want to do super chats now? Sure. 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 Let's do some super chats. So we'll get into a couple of stories. I definitely want to cover Matt Walsh's documentary. Oh yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. A couple of super chats. Uh, so shout I, out their names. We love our people. Giving yeah, the super chat. I for sure will. And George kind of already answered this one, but I think it might be good to reiterate because somebody asked it again in the chat. RSG four two six said, um, "Is now a good time to buy real estate, uh, specifically in the Midwest?" But you were saying about how that's a price question, right? You got it. So I'd ask. <laughs> is I'd it ask, cheap or is it expensive? That's She's right. RSG. Notes. That's right. Smart or whatever people. the yeah, name right. is. <laughs> ask yourself: Is it cheap or is it expensive? If it's cheap, buy it. If it's expensive, don't buy it. Love that. I love the way you just simply, you know, the, you know the kiss. Uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Just yeah. if it's cheap, buy it. If it's expensive, don't buy it. Don't worry yeah. about. And if you just look at a chart of that local real estate market adjusted for inflation as far back as you can go, you're going to see that it's at an all time high adjusted for inflation. So I'll just I'll give you the answer without having to look up a chart. <laughs> Thank you for that mm -hmm. awesome question. What else you got, Kels? Uh, this one's just a comment uh, from uh, Hexican American. We yeah. all getting hashtag whacked tattoos. Thank you, G's, for keeping it real and leading from the front. <laughs> I um, know him. Another question was uh, from Meditating Frenchie. What's up, Gammon? Thoughts on first time home buying, which uh, on the press on the precipice of depression. Also, thoughts on buying guns and ammo as hard asset investments. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you could do a little bit better than that. I, I like to set up a portfolio on something I, I call a 10-80-10. So 10% would be insurance. And for me, that's just physical gold. The 80% would be investments. Now, I define that as something that pays me to own it. So right now, real estate, maybe not great in the United States for reasons we just discussed. Now, if you're an expert, if you're a Kenny McElroy, mm -hmm. well, that's a completely different discussion. But for the average investor right now, I, I kind of shy away from it. And I lean more on the dividend-paying stocks, especially in the commodity space, because I think we're going, or we've already entered, a long-term super cycle in commodities, which usually lasts about 10 to 15 years. Then uh, you've got the uh, speculative side, which is the other 10% of the portfolio. This, these are assets that don't necessarily pay you to own them, but you see good asymmetry, and you're looking at that panic versus hysteria component. So, and then cheap and expensive. One thing I really like in that space right now is uranium. So buying physical uranium, which you can through the Sprott Trust as an example. Um, and I'm not saying buy it now, but it's definitely on my watch list. Mm -hmm. uh, if it ever gets, you know, I'm, I'm waiting. It, it's definitely cheap uh, looking at a historic chart, but especially if it gets down near the range where it was in uh, 2020, you know, I, I want to back up the Brinks truck uh, w with that 10% of my portfolio. I would never do it 100%. And so I think that if you, you're setting things up that way, regardless of whether your portfolio is $25,000 or $25 million, uh, you're going to be hedging out a lot of your risk because mm -hmm. such a large percentage of your portfolio is paying you cash to own it, which is going to offset the negative carry that you have on your cash position, which is separate from that 1080-10, to take advantage of an opportunity where asset prices come down if we get a recession or an economic depression. So I think that's kind of the best advice that I can give uh, to people. Just think in terms of that 10-80-10 portfolio. Think in terms of panic and hysteria and then cheap and expensive. What I like about that is that 10% insurance, safer bet, some gold, silver. I don't know if you put Bitcoin in that category. No, Bitcoin would be speculative. It would be more speculative. The 80%. Whether it's real estate, whether it's dividend stocks, you know, foundational type stuff. Yeah, and it's the a other ten percent buying a business that pays you exactly, and the other ten percent take a shot. Uh, respect to that. Um, what else you got? Uh, that's it for super chats. But you also did get a shout out from PVD Podcast. He said, "Great lineup, you guys are getting <laughs> ah, yeah. yeah, PVD Podcast. I think I'm familiar with the, who I that is. Yeah, yeah. I, think oh, yeah. I know he that says, guy. Dude. I know he that said guy. Hi from okay. Monica. All right. Awesome. Thank you, PVD and Monica. I got a, qu I have a question, like kind of a follow up to that. 
I don't know if you know this or not, but I am now a greenie. I am now an environmentalist. You know why? Really? Because I heard of offset carbon credits market, mm. courtesy of our good friend uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, and yeah. Now I understand why so many people are like suddenly uh, becoming environmentally aware and they want yeah, to invest yeah. in green projects. Yes, because of the market that's developing in offset uh, carbon credits yeah, right now that everyone in the world has to play by. Yeah. Do you think you're going to, is there any, is that lucrative? Is that a good uh, future? I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. It's just not a game that I play mm -hmm. because to me, you're angel investing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like to do that. I, you know, where's the cash flow? I, I like to, another uh, kind of saying I have that may be helpful to the viewers is I always want to buy a dollar for 50 cents. Mm -hmm. I never want to buy a dollar for three dollars, hoping it goes to five dollars. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with carbon credits and whatnot, you know what's the market? Is it cheap? I don't know. I, I yeah. can't price. And who it. are you going to sell it to? Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's <laughs> for people who are experts in that. I'm sure there's a massive opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's just not the type of game I, I the, play. The, I like to look idea. at a business that's got strong cash flows mm -hmm. and wait for panic to buy that cash, that dollar worth of cash flow for 50 cents. That's what that, I mean, that, and that's the, the panic side of that is actually the, the, the primary element of that market is because what happens is you buy those credits in the beginning of the year and nobody needs them and you're sitting on top of them until tax season comes back around and then you sell the, theoretically sell those offset carbon credits to companies who are like, it's more expensive for them to actually initiate these environmental yeah. things than it is to just simply go buy credits on the open market that you now have a hold of. And so like right around October, November, right before, you know, the, the it flips over, the, the year flips over, now you sell them at a profit. That's, yeah, the, that's the idea. Yeah, let me give you an example, a specific example for your viewers, uh, just based on what has happened in the last couple of days. Altria. So the cigarette maker, mm -hmm. okay, they just got nailed because the, some governing board banned those Juul. Yeah, Juul's been officially banned, exactly. Yeah, so Altria, Altria takes a massive hit, okay? I don't know if it's down 10, 15%, which is big for that stock because it doesn't move much. Well, this is panic in the market. So what the market's not realizing is that you've got India, you've got China, you've got the emerging markets that over the long term, as people go from very, very poor into the middle class, they consume more things that are unhealthy. Uh, they consume more sugar. Mm. Uh, they consume more alcohol. Red meat. Red meat. They smoke more cigarettes. Maybe so, not in India, though. Red meat. So sure, you might have the, 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 the decrease in demand for Juul, but you long term, mm -hmm. you've got a lot of tailwind there. But even if demand stays the same, so what? Because of this price drop, because of the panic, now all of a sudden the dividend yield goes up to almost 9%. It's like 8.2, 8.3. So you can buy, which by the way, you're buying a, a company that historically has always, almost always increased their dividend. That is one of the safest dividends you can get. So that's an example of buying a dollar for 50 cents based on some short-term panic mm -hmm. and putting that in that 80% of your portfolio that's going to pay you to own it. You got one more? Yeah. Uh, Doug uh, said, Soy Boy Mafia, we're in here. Oh, What's God. Gammon's <laughs> channel? Thanks. <laughs> Gammon channel. Do we, let's put that in the in the link below. But George, go ahead and give yourself a plug. George Gammon. I've got two channels: George Gammon and then Rebel Capitalist. Rebel Capitalist. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, if you're not subscribed, the to the Rational me, Mail. Like, there and it is. I have the Rational Mail clips for those of you who don't want to watch a four-hour live stream every Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. I got to tell you, the <laughs> fact that you can just go boom talk for hours on end is. He must this, like the way he this voice no, it's, sounds. It's no, it's just that's how freaking no, smart that brain is in there. It's okay, just, it's it's stream of consciousness. Amazing. <laughs> Anything else right now? Okay, awesome. Thank you for the super chats, guys, and thank you for subscribing and liking the video. We appreciate you. Yes. Uh, let's transition right now, literally mm. transition <laughs> uh -oh. uh, to we what a woman. We didn't get to talk about this on Fresh and Fit last. Yes. Night. Let's transition to what a woman is now. If you if, would you pull up, uh, I, I sent you a link for Matt Walsh. I don't think we can play the clip right now, but he's a member of the Daily Wire. That's mm -hmm. Ben Shapiro's podcast network. Before that, he was an he was a essayist or a journalist or something like that. I want to see if it was for, for Breitbart or some conservative media. I can't remember. Um, you can just Google Matt Walsh, or I'm sure what is a woman that you can you can find that. It's but I want I want to give this guy a plug. But he's been doing some very impressive work right there with this. What is a woman? I don't know if mm -hmm. we're allowed to show the. Um, 
a clip. I don't know. I don't want to get flagged okay. or anything like it's that. It's okay. I think enough people understand. Cause exactly. Was, especially in my circle of, of, of guys right now. Hit and, images, and, uh, would you? I, I should say, um, Jedediah did a, a recently did a show on it. Go to images. Back out out of this, Kelsey, just so we can get a give this guy a plug. But then I want to roll it a bit. Have you seen it yet? I've seen uh, the parts that you're about to show right here. Okay, sure. gotcha. Uh, and you don't, again, if if you think you're gonna get like a copyright strike or something, I don't think you will. I don't know. We're not we're not being like. But you've been talking about Matt Walsh and his debate with the bearded lady for I, since months November, now. since October, exactly. or November of last year. Actually. So so Rolo, what is a woman? Oh my goodness. Well, it depends on who you ask, right? We need to have a, either an objective uh, opinion of what that is, which is what, uh, I mean, ostensibly, which is what Matt Walsh was trying to achieve with this documentary. Now, I, Matt Walsh, if you're watching, I feel used. I feel very, very used by you because I, um, I actually turned down an interview with um, uh, Dr. Phil at one point. Um, he wanted, this was in, uh, August or September of 2020. And really all they, all his producers wanted was for me to go on the show and sort of like lose my mind at Tommy Laren at the time. Cause I, I guess I showed up in the algorithm somehow and that wasn't my brand. I was, I didn't want to have to have that kind of, you know, back and forth. Mm -hmm. It was too much red meat, I guess at the time. However, when I saw Matt Walsh on the Dr. Phil show, this was back in November and he's there with I can't, I don't know the person's name. I just call him the bearded lady. Mm -hmm. And it's a, uh, it's a transgender man Kels. who, um, he was on there with a, a couple of transgender men and I think some sort of college professor who the was bearded a, a lady. gender Pull study. Matt Walsh, the bearded lady. <laughs> it, it'll show up. I probably yeah, bring up my, right my video on it. Um, but it, during that, that conversation, um, it was really this back and forth between, you know, Wanting to get this empirical, objective, standardized, uh, there you go, um, this this objective definition, and that's really kind of not what Matt is after in this. It's really more like red meat for the conservative uh, you know, talking point, you know, red meat for uh, viewers of, the, of Daily Wire is what it is. And again, you know, that's neither here nor there. But what what gets me is that there is sort of this ostensibly there's this want to know. Um, a, a, an objective, definitive, like, is it, is it biological? Is it, is it, it you know, gender is a, a social construct? What is it? And it, 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 you're just going, you're just getting the same sort of emotionalism on the woke side, the, the, you know, bearded lady side of things. And then you've got, uh, Matt Walsh on the opposite side, who's really trying to hit it from another like emotionalist argument, which is really about moralism and, and, and ethics and, and, uh, religion. And this is just the, the way thing, this is right and wrong, right. Versus, well, uh, ambiguity, like deliberate ambiguity about it. And it's really an emotionalist argument versus another emotionalist argument. And somewhere in between there is the empirical data that says, here's what a woman actually is. OK, can we can we cut the shit? And please, can we just get to an empirical uh, definition of this? And the reason for that is like I and I explained this when I first watched the uh, the the Dr. Phil interview um, is you're never going to get that empirical, definitive, uh, objective answer from the sort of woke, wokesy left side of things, because the moment they do is the moment their entire identity collapses. That this guy, the the bearded ladies, and I'm using this as an example mm -hmm. of of a greater whole and all of this. But once you have a definitive answer, if it's not ambiguous, if it's not subjective, it's not relative, if it's not something that you can go, well, you know, it's all defined by the person kind of thing. Once you say, no, a woman is this and you're not it, mm -hmm. that's when the conversation dies. And that, as I've said before, if there is no boogeyman, no one gets paid. So when Matt and Matt Walsh is engaging in exactly the same boogeyman side of things that the other opposite side is is as well so it's this back and forth and they both make money off of this can you uh can you imagine being as pig-headed as matt walsh can you imagine being as woke as the bearded lady that that's what gets eyes on the screen that's mm -hmm. what get, it's the car crash in nascar nobody watches to to see who wins the race they want to see who crashes the car yes. right that's the car crash right there and so what Matt has done is uh, I thought that this was sort of uh, it, when I first saw the Dr. Phil interview, I thought that it was supposed to be something that was like just this one off kind of thing where he was asking what is a woman. No, it was actually it was meant to be content for a future documentary, which is now out, which is what is a woman. Mm. So what Matt has done is he's gone around the world 
And he's uh, gone to women's marches. He's gone to, he's interviewed uh, like politicians, uh, congresswomen, uh, congressmen, uh, senators, whatever, um, uh, college professors who are teaching gender studies, uh, uh, doctors who are, do, are performing um, uh, transgender, like uh, from you know one sex to another yeah, reassignment. sex. Reassignment. Reassignment. Uh, was it hormone blockers? We were just talking about um, how Biden just uh, signed off on uh, the fact that they're never, they're no longer going to t to to talk about how tr being transgender is a behavioral decision, which is funny because it's a, it goes entirely against what the argument was on Dr. Phil from the, the bearded lady side of things. Gender is a social construct. There's a difference or there's a separation between sex and gender. That is categorically false. And you can prove that it is false. Because if you go and you look at, say, well, I think it was the four laws of uh, behavioral genetics, you look at the, look that up at some point. But, um, we can we can show and we can prove that gender is actually has a biological evolutionary component to it. That's why we call it sexual dimorphism. You're never going to have that conversation when the bearded lady or the feminist uh, professor is trying to take digs at you, like who hurt you or why is this so important to you? You know, is there something wrong with you? Maybe you're questioning your sexuality. Why are you so insecure in your masculinity? All of those responses are emotional responses. That's emotionalism. It's an attempt to take away this empirical want for a definitive answer and go, well, the reason why you want that answer is because there's something very wrong with you. You must be insecure. You must have a small PP or something like that, compensating, right? And so what happens is when we get to the point where we're, he's doing the, the documentary and he's going and having these back and forth, it's, I mean, I like the premise of it, but I think the delivery and the execution of it is really, really bad. Simply because all it is doing is it's it's tapping into the fresh and fit template of um, of sort of podcasting that, that sensationalism because people will get really upset with Myron and Fresh for kicking women off the off the show. We had uh, what was it Brody was on here and she was uh, really really upset and said, "Oh, I think they're closet misogynists and everything because they won't let you talk and they'll just kick you off the show and just indiscriminately, which is completely false." But they do that's the template though. That's the car crash that they're look that the the audience is looking for. Mm -hmm. So they go, "Yeah, get her, get her, get her, get her." The Jerry Springer well, Right. Movie. Well, Matt does exactly the same template in what is a woman so what he does is he gets these these people on uh whether it's somebody uh on the street or it's the senator or it's the uh the the gender studies professor or whoever gets them into the interview and then says you know puts them on the spot there and they can't answer the question or they can't give a definitive answer to the question he just sort of paints them into this logical corner and what do they do they rage quit they go oh i think this interview is over and they mm -hmm. storm off the thing all they've done is what Myron calls Frank Castling, right? It's kicking them off the stage, except for they do it themselves. And it's the same exact template from the people who would have a problem with Myron and Fresh doing it, but it's okay when Matt Walsh does it. Hmm. I'm wondering if you Google what is a woman, what shows up? Like, is this... Like this is so not anything that I ever think. What is a man? Was I'm just they don't. I'm, and, and he I'm a dude. I, I he do, do things. He that's doesn't it. want an answer because yeah. because as long as there is no answer, everybody gets paid. Yeah, I think. I mean, it may be a little off topic, but what comes to mind when I hear Rollo discuss this is um, one of the ways you can tell that a movement is complete BS or that a narrative. Its main purpose is to usurp power and control, is if the movement really has no definitive conclusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we think about the war on drugs, okay, the war on terrorism. How would you determine when we're finished? Are, are we ever going to eradicate terrorism? Are we going to eradicate drugs? The answer is no. Right. So what this tells you is that the people that are pushing this narrative really don't want it to end mm. because the narrative itself allows them to usurp power, control, and wealth, right? It's like the, the green movement. 
you know, the, and I'm not here to debate climate change or anything like that. But what I can tell you is that the, let's go say the global elite, they don't care about the climate. They don't care about the temperature in the ocean. They're just using this as a Trojan horse that has no end. Therefore, you know, if it's 2050, if it's 2100, well, that's fantastic because it's so far in the future. It's so ambiguous. It's so difficult to pin down mm -hmm. that you just need to trust me and we just need to do whatever mm. I say and you just need to hand over your personal freedom and liberty because this boogeyman out there that you really can't quantify. So again, whether it's the war on terrorism, the war on drugs, whether it's uh, you know this woke movement, you know, how would you define if, or how would you determine if we've done enough? Yep, the, the, you know, the, the, the gay folks, they're, they're good to go. We can move on to the next uh, topic of discussion, or we can move on to the next battle cry. You, you, we'll never, ever, ever get there, and that's the intention. And I think that's kind of, if you're trying to go through all of these global movements that we have in the world today, that's the ultimate sniff test is can you define a logical conclusion? If the answer is no, then you know the people pushing it don't care about the narrative. They simply care about power and control. And a lot of times, the people who support that, who are who identify with, like say the woke side of things, or the even the conservative side of things, their personality, who they are as a person, is invested in that constant churn yeah, of keeping right. that that, uh, that momentum and that activism going. They're the useful idiots, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> as, as Stalin would say, or uh, Lenin, or they, as Milton Friedman called them, the do-gooders. Mm -hmm. And they just get caught up. They're just kind of uh, the people that are pulling the strings. They understand that they can take mm -hmm. advantage of those people and get right. them to do their their bidding and that they have good intentions you know the do-gooders and the useful idiots they have good intentions right. they mm -hmm. want the world to be a better place uh but unfortunately they're just they've they've yeah. drank the kool-aid of the puppeteer we've become very good at and i put this in this in my fifth book in the i think it's in the, uh, the first chapter it's called brand management i talk about churn marketing i don't know if the, you're familiar with the term of uh, the term of churn marketing and what it is is for instance, Tinder doesn't want you to have a good relationship. They don't want you to get married. They don't want you to find the love of your soulmate right. and the love of your life right. because the moment they do, they lose a customer. Right, they delete yeah. the app. So as long as you have a shitty relationship and you come back to the to the app, that's what they want. They get you yeah. back just into like, the churn. It's just like the politicians don't want your life to improve. Right, they want because you to Because if your life improves, constantly. then you don't need them. Right. Uh, but if your life stays the same, if it gets worse then you need them even more. They stay in power. Mm -hmm. They keep the control. They keep the wealth. We, so, so they want to keep you down. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 to their, it's in their best interest. We, and we do this on so many different levels. Like, I, of course, my wheelhouse is Red Pill and Intersexual Dynamics, mm -hmm. which I just said, you know, Tinder. But it, we can't watch a movie anymore. We have to watch a series. We have to watch a Netflix series, you know. If you, I just finished Ozark, and I'm like, no, the series is over. It was so good, right? And we were just like agonizing over this, but it's because we watched from from the beginning all the way to the end of what season four, or whatever it was. Uh, uh, was it Stranger Things is coming out? You know, the the last, the mm -hmm. final chapters of, of of Stranger Things, which is not a bad thing. But the thing is, is if you think about it, if you watch Stranger Things from season one all the way up to where they're at right now, how many hours have you spent? watching Stranger Things. Oh, man. How many hours did you did I watch you know Ozark for a good series, right? But what it does is we don't know how to tell a story anymore. It used to be that we could watch a movie in 2 hours, it was like beginning, development, character development, uh, you know, setbacks, climax, aftermath, and then hopefully maybe there's a sequel or something within 2 hours we used to be able to to do that and we enjoyed that. Now we hate that. We hate the 2 hour format because we're like, well where's the next one? Where's the next thing? And I, I'll just joke. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell my wife out here in just a second. If I want to go and watch like Lord of the Rings, right? If I want to watch The Fellowship of the Ring or Two Towers or something like that, that's a three-hour investment because it's a three-hour long movie, right? But we'll sit there and we'll watch like four or five hours of, of whatever series is going on because it's just one after the next after the next. And that brings you back into the churn. Now, that's just the way that we consume our, our, our entertainment right now. We're not looking for writers who can write a standalone mm -hmm. story 
We're looking for somebody who can have staying power in a series. We watch series now. We don't watch movies anymore. Right. Now, try to think, and I'll just, for you playing the home game out there, try to think of other churns that you get locked into that just keeps going. It could be politics. It could be religion. It could mm-hmm. be your ideology. It could be what it, it could be your family for that matter. But we're, we're so, we, we think in terms of churn right now and we don't even realize that we're thinking of it. Yeah, I think a trick for most people that might benefit them is just be cognizant of how much content you're consuming and try to make sure that you're creating more content than you're consuming. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Because, or, or, because and you can replace content with whatever it is that's getting you closer to your goals, right? It's too easy but for it to have a, your creativity done for you. Yeah. And it's just, you know, if I find my, even in, you know, I've got a, a YouTube channel on macroeconomics, but if I find myself uh, listening to four hours of podcasts and only doing a half an hour video, that, that's that's not good. I want to make sure that, okay, if, if I'm listening to four hours of content, that how am I going to create five hours of content based on what I listen to to make sure you're always ahead of that curve and you're not falling victim to just, uh, just I, I don't want to say being a loser, mm. but uh, you know not achieving your goals as quickly as you could. What does Kiyosaki say is if you're not a brand, you're a commodity? I haven't heard him say that, but that sounds like something he'd say. probably sounds like something Well, it's kind of like yeah. one of the things I always say, George, is, and it kind of goes to, you know, I, I enjoy simplifying things. You said, hey, is it cheap or is it expensive? You know, it's very easy to answer that. So what I do, you know, the, the greatest commodity in life is time. Right. We all mm-hmm. have, you know, yes. so what I, um, what I always say is you can either invest your time or you can spend your time. Mm. In, the, in my 20s, I was the king of spending my time. Nightclubs, games, fantasy football, partying, drunk, you know, yeah, just yeah. spending time. You're a party boy. A party boy. I was a party boy. <laughs> not now a man, I'm a not party, a party man. man yet. I'm very <laughs> conscious of investing my time versus spending my time. Very rarely am I just spending. I don't have Netflix. I canceled it. I, mm. I pulled the plug. I don't have enough TV anymore. If I watch YouTube, it's because I want to watch what George Gammon has to say on the economy mm-hmm. or what Rolo Tomasi has to say on transgenderism or what Fresh and Fit have to say with their drama that's going on or what's going on in the news. I'm investing my time because you talked about always be learning, always be learning. And you can spend your time. Like I look, I've watched Game of Thrones. I had a girlfriend. She wanted to watch it. I get it. So you're not going to always How many hours your did time. you watch I think, Game of Thrones? I think Thrones. people can But it's a of- lot of time. I think people can use that as a hack in other areas of their life that they might not even think about, especially as Americans. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Um, prior to 2019, even though I would spend a lot of time in Medellin, I never considered having a, a, a gal do the cooking, you know, cook and then have someone specific yep. to do my laundry and make sure that the closet was organized. If I need a light bulb, go. it just sem- seemed like an extravagance that I just didn't, you know, like, George, how hard is it to change a light bulb? Um, but then what I did is I actually did a TV show in Medellin early 2019 before I started the YouTube channel. So I was taking, this was occupying so much of my time that I just didn't have a choice. So I'm like, I've got to hire someone to do mm-hmm. the cooking and you know, all these things. And I had this gal for probably two weeks and I said, how did I ever live yep. without this? Mm. And I think, you know, now that I, when I come back to the United States, and I don't have that team of people with me, mm-hmm. right? That entourage that I have in <laughs> that I have in Medellin. You know, I've got to go get my own water. I've got to go, and and we don't even think about that as Americans. <laughs> but if you actually wrote down yeah. every single minute you spend during the week taking your kids to school, going to the grocery store, picking up the dry cleaning, running an errand, do this, this, and this, it's like 10, 20 hours mm-hmm. a week. When that's twenty hours that you could spend on doing something incredibly productive, hundred percent. Right. Well, it comes down to George. You you hit the nail on the head. Just as you've been doing all day today, what's your time worth? That's yeah. right. What's your time worth? That's Patrick right. talks about like how he loves to iron. Like I, no chance am I ironing. Like, N- like nor would I. No, but he lo- But he said, look, my time is worth a thousand dollars an hour. That's right. 
And for me to, to iron for an hour, I could pay someone $20 an hour to do that. I'm losing $980 by, by ironing. ironing. And then you just got to back into what you're doing in your life. Now, look, not everybody's going to always have a maid and someone to iron and a cook and clean. I get it. But what can you eliminate from your life yeah. to take back time? Do you, yeah, do you, you know, look, I, I got a question. Do you feel like you've been put out? Like if you like watch a football game or you like went to watch a movie or something, you go, God, what, I could have made, it was two hours to watch this movie. Could I have made more money? Like it would have been time better yes. spent. I don't get that two hours back. So I feel bad about having like sort of having this mental popcorn and just sort of like enjoying, you're enjoying the movie. Yeah. You like the movie, right? It's good to like, you know, have some power down time, but it's like, I, cause I get to the point, like the more I get into doing, like, you know, doing what I do, mm -hmm. I'm like, I could have read another chapter in the book. Yep. Yeah. I could have done this. I could have done that. I personally, I just allocate specific time mm -hmm. to just doing whatever I want to do and enjoying myself and then time to being productive. So, you know, that would be something I do on a Friday night or something on a Saturday night. Uh, that is not something I would do, you know, Monday through Thursday. No. And, uh, you know, I try to figure out what times of the day I'm the most productive. Yeah. Just knowing myself well. Morning for me. The same here. Yeah. So what I do is from the time I wake up at 630 to the time I go to lunch, I'm just everyone that works for me knows that you don't bother me. Don't mm -hmm. even if the door shut, don't even knock mm -hmm. on it. Do not interrupt me. That's because, George time. That's right, because I'm, I'm focusing and I'm trying to really determine, you know, what is the next video I want to do? What I'm researching, I'm maybe uh, determining what questions I want to ask in an interview. Or I'm, I'm, you know, putting all these pieces of the puzzle together. And my concentration is incredibly valuable. You know, I read somewhere that if you're in that zone, so to speak, mm -hmm. And if your if your uh, concentration is interrupted, it takes you like twenty minutes mm -hmm. or so to get back into that frame yes. of mind, and so that's something. Flow state. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's something that I'm always cognizant of. Mm. So that time of the day, Monday through Friday, is always allocated to that. And then I, I go to lunch usually at the same time, or I have lunch prepared, and I've got kind of a system of how I do things. And then I, I, I get a lot of stuff done after lunch. And then, but it's it's not really the research. It's not the heady stuff. Usually, I'm doing my live streams mm -hmm. uh, in the afternoon after lunch, uh, and then I go to the gym every day, uh, right around three thirty, four o'clock before it's busy. And then when I come back, you know, I get dinner. That's time for me just to relax and just kind of take my mind off of everything. And I start the same thing the next day. I found that for me personally, that's the way that I can mm -hmm. be most productive. So wherever I am, I try to replicate that to the greatest Love of my that. ability. And I think what, what our audience can take away from what George just explained is he has a system. Mm -hmm. He systematized his life yep, that's right. to basically get the most and extract the most out of your time. That's right. Yeah. And I respect the hell and out you're, of that. And you're a note taker. I noticed that too. I, if you see me on, I'll try to have it with me now, but when I'm on shows, I've always got my notebook going mm -hmm. here. I'll tell you the other, you want a life hack? It's very similar. And, and tell me if you do this too. Um, I notice that people who are like ideas guys, they keep notebooks with them all mm -hmm. the time oh, because okay. I have a notebook. I've got I've got so many damn notebooks. They're, they're all I've, usually I have a dedicated notebook for whatever book I happen to be writing on at that time. Then I've yeah. got my general purpose one, which is just like if anybody read it, they'd be like, this guy's insane. Right. Because I'm just writing ideas down as they come to me, because as you were saying, mm -hmm. when you get out of the flow state, it gets it takes a long time to get back into yep. it. So you better damn well write it down before somebody interrupts you and says, hey, we got to, you know, go do something here. Or, yeah. You don't do anything for a living. Why don't you come and help me and pick me up at the airport? You know, that kind of thing. Um, but what I notice is that I my my two most productive times, well, one, of course, is in the morning, first thing in the morning. And I have to have the notebook ready right there. And I don't know why this is, but when I get up at like 1.20 in the morning and I have to go take a piss, that's when all these ideas start to come to me because yeah. uh, you're completely like unclouded by all these distractions and anything that's coming in from the periphery. And I know that if I don't go and write down those ideas after. right after I flush the toilet, I bet I'm going to forget it by the time I wake up in the morning. Mm. So I started, that's what so, sort of made me a, a note taker as I'm going and doing things. And I'm right. Even when I'm like with Kiyosaki or with, with Ken, I'm just writing stuff down, just like sort of mm -hmm. stream of consciousness stuff that might turn into a blog post. It might turn 
turn into a chapter in the book. It might turn into something I talk about on the show as well that I can use. You were saying, how do you go for four hours? That's how I go for four hours yeah. on a on a Sunday live stream. By yeah. the way, the um, the uh, we're wrapping up, but the um, when I used to do a stand up comedy, and I did that for many years in my uh, early to mid twenties, always had a notepad. Yeah, and the difference between someone who's good and great. Is when at one twenty in the morning and you just get up and take a piss and you have an idea. I get mad at myself if I don't. If you <laughs> don't write it, yeah. I'll remember it in the morning. No, no you, you won't, won't bro. Yeah. Write it yeah. down. Do I it think now. we have one last super chat. And I've got a hack for that as well. Yeah. By the way. I mean, yes, I do. In my Toomey bag outside, uh -huh. I've got a notebook. <laughs> we have one last super chat and then we'll just give final thoughts here. Go ahead, Kel. It's from Allie B. Hey, guys. Rolo mm. read a couple of your books and recently read Rational Male Religion. Can mm -hmm. you define adultery from a red pill lens? Adultery from a red pill lens. Uh, it, I think it depends on which party is doing the the infidelity and the cheating. Really what it is, is it's uh, you've made a commitment. And so whenever we're talking about adultery or we're talking about uh, fidelity, when it comes to uh, a man and a woman, which is I, what I presume they're getting at, is there has to be two elements. There has to be either opportunity to cheat and there has to be a reason to cheat. Okay. So those are the two elements for it. And then there's also has to be a commitment. So you're break essentially what adultery is, is you're breaking a commitment. Mm. So if there is no, that's why I have a real problem with poly Paul, you know, polygamous polyamory kind of thing. It's like, I don't see any point in having somebody who's like sort of your main girl. And then you have like, or guy, depending on how it is. Um, and then having a open an open relationship because to me it's like that's very like logistically that's 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 stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you just simply not play the field? Why would you simply just not be spinning plates or dating non exclusively while somebody's at home going, I wonder if he's cheating on me? Like that does it like logistically, practically, it doesn't make any sense. But from a red pill perspective, as far as like adultery is concerned, adultery is really a, a, a moralistic uh, judgment call at that at that time, because we like to use a term like adultery. Really what it is, is it's you are breaking a commitment that you've made to someone else. And you could technically say that if you're in a business arrangement and you go out and you're moonlighting on on your on your job or something, are you technically committing like commercial adultery on your employers? So. Um, it's really essentially a, a breaking of commitment between two people who have agreed to compromise their mating strategies with one another. So if the guy says, I will forsake all others and I will not have sex with anybody else but you, and that's the way it's going to be uh, in sickness and in health till death do us part, you know, well, yada, yada, yada. And the woman says, okay, great. You're the best I can do. I'm going to stick with you no matter what through thick and thin until death do us part, blah, blah, blah. And the kid's going to be yours. Okay. So if there's a if there's a counterbalance to sort of like infidelity, there's also cuckoldry on top of that. Like, oh, I lied to you. Sorry, the kid's actually not your baby. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, any more super chats before that's we wrap my up? Quick, that's Thank my you. quick wrap up. By the way, anytime you say, um, what, what's it called? Uh, what's the biological term of mating? You say, uh, what do you call it? For something oh, mating? A mating strategy? Mating uh, strategy. Mating strategy. Sexual I just think strategy. of gorillas. Yeah, well, <laughs> of course. I mean, I, I break it down into nuts and bolts. That's the best I can do. Yes. My gorilla man right here. Um, how about this? I'd like to end it with this. We talked about, um, this might be a little, uh, like, cue the music right here. But I think, I think you know, like the emotional music. But I think both you guys are crushing it in your respective fields. So I want to, the, the, the question that I have in mind is, for each of you, for George, if you want to go first, what do you want your legacy to be? Freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. Uh, one of the things that you were discussing and Rollo was discussing when you were talking about liberty, one of the things that popped into my head is this second channel that I started called Rebel Capitalist. And the reason I did this is because I saw the mandates, I saw the lockdowns, and I saw us basically on a road to serfdom, you know, if you want to look at Hayek's book. And uh, if you study history, you know where that leads, and it does not lead to a good place. So uh, what I did is I set up this channel specifically to push back against authoritarianism, not to make money, it's not to do anything other than to do my very best to make sure that people are opening up their eyes to what's happening in the world around them and understanding how we can fight back. Because if you don't do it right now, you're going to wake up in 20 or 30 years and it's going to look like East Germany. 
It, it absolutely is. Or it's going to look like... Canada already looks like he's That's Germany. right. Or, or <laughs> Australia or something like that. Our freedom and liberty is very, very precious. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, free market capitalism, although it's far from perfect, it's the best way to increase the standard of living for the poor and middle class. So if I can have one legacy, it would be that George Gammon always did everything possible to stand up and fight for these core principles, which he believed uh, will benefit society and the human race for you know many decades to come. Awesome, man. Rolo, same question. Oh, geez. Author I, of the five-time best-selling book, yes, The Rational Male. I like that. What do you want your legacy to be? I, well, as I said before, I I look at legacy in terms of body of work rather than like the trophies on your shelf, right? So uh, I hope to have a. By the time I check out of this planet, uh, I hope to have left a uh, a dent in the universe. Not in, I, I'm stealing Steve Jobs, you know, quote there, but. Um, I, I hope that my the book the book and or books that I've written um, are evergreen or they are living texts and I've I've uh, described at least the first book as a living text because people don't just read the rational mail and they put it back on their shelf and they go oh I read the book right they come back to it they highlight it they underscore mm -hmm. it it's dog eared and whenever I'm signing somebody who's been a longtime fan of mine it's always this just bedraggled yeah, uh, I'm sure. a book Highlights and I'm signing and, it I'm like. Yeah. That's what I'm doing this for. That yeah. guy right there is who I'm doing this for. Yeah, you um, know what Kiyosaki calls that? What a personal artifact. Yes, yes, and it's it's like I said, it's a it's a a living text in the sense that like you come back to it to refer to it at different points in your life. So you go, oh, I wonder what I wonder what Rollo said about this because I'm going through this particular hmm, thing, and right. I didn't I read about that, and they'll come back to it. And I'm glad that I have that that capacity to sort of articulate what a lot of people already know, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I hate to be a schmaltzy about it and talking in terms of like red pill, blue pill, matrix, this kind of thing. But like to unplug people from this way of thinking that they've sort of been conditioned to. Whenever I talk about blue pill, I always add the word conditioned, blue pill conditioning to it. And to sort of break people out of this thought pattern, it's sometimes it's really hard. I mean, unplugging guys from the matrix is dirty work. It's it's like triage. You know, you got to help the ones you can. And you breed last rights to the dying, right? That's pretty much what it comes down to. And I'm hoping that by the time I check out, that my books are still around. That people go, they're still evergreen, right? They're still they're still a living text. That even after I'm gone, they go, this is what this dude who was my great grandfather who went by Rollo Tomasi wrote this, wrote this book and boy, this, he, he had, he had some serious shit to say and just, and just to help other people once again, educate, of course. And so I agree with you on that terms is to educate, but also to sort of illuminate, I guess, and to enlighten people say, it's not what you think it is. It's more, it's, this is, it's like the allegory of the cave. It's the guy that is in the, in the, you know, Plato's allegory of the cave where there's shadows on the wall and people are like all entertained by mm -hmm. that. And the guy finds his way out of the cave and he figures out who's making the shadows on the cave and he goes out and he sees this wonderful, beautiful world and he comes back in and he tries to tell the people that are in the cave, Hey, there's this great world out there. Mm -hmm. And some of them go out there. Some of them don't. And they eventually kill the guy that um, that actually went out there to go inform everybody. It never gets to that part of the story. But um, if that's the price you have to pay, it's almost like, you know, it, I, I've, I've described the red pill and what I do is fire. OK, you can use it for a negative purpose and destructive purpose. You can burn your house down with it. You can kill your neighbors with it. You set your neighbors on fire or you can use it to heat your home. You can use it to cook your food. You can use it in a positive, uh, a positive way as well. And I'm hoping more people will say, "Oh, I can use this constructively rather than using it destructively." And that's where I usually end the conversation when people ask me, "What's your legacy?" I hope that people will take the fire of the red pill or whatever it is that I do, and they use it to their benefit, and they use it to heat their house and cook their food. <laughs> I guess. I love it. This has been probably my favorite episode we've done here because yeah. I think we've learned so much here from these uh, two fine gentlemen right here. If you watch this entire episode and you have not taken something that will transform your life by what George Gamma had to say, what Ro Rolo Tomasi had to say, I don't know what to tell you. You're not going to improve. <laughs> I don't know. But that's just what we do here on the Southcast. Mm -hmm. We bring incredible people with incredible stories. Lots of value. That brings value <laughs> here at Valuetainment. Yes. Uh, again, if you have not subscribed... 
Valuetainment money, like the video. And if you want to see Rolo back again, I which I'm sure he will be, mm -hmm. go ahead, let us know in the comments. And if you'd like to see George Gammon here again, subscribe to his channel and drop a comment right there. Until next time, you know this is Adam Salzik, Salzik, Save That Money. We'll see you guys next time.